team is very happy to be supporting the Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association on the on-farm applied research and monitoring or on-farm project. Before we begin our program today, we wish to recognize the long history of First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples of Ontario and show respect today to their traditional territory on which we live and work. Please note that the forum is being recorded and will be posted to the on-farm website. My team will also create a summary report that Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association will share on the on-farm website in March. Uh, we have a jam-packed agenda today for this morning, so if we could advance to the agenda slide, that would be great. After the welcoming remarks, we'll hear some highlights from the on-farm program. We'll also do a deeper dive into the soil health indicators as well as the water quality indicators. So there's lots of science coming your way this morning, which will be exciting. A panel will also explore the agronomic benefits and co-benefits of beneficial management practices. We'll wrap up our time together by noon. As we have a large group here today, we ask that all attendees keep their sound and video off. Our speakers will turn on the sound and video for their presentations. We would also like to encourage you to use the chat box throughout the forum and ask that you add your first name and last name or last initial in your Zoom profile to facilitate this discussion, just so we know who you are so I can uh, mention who's asking the question. Um, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat and to enter any questions you have for the speakers and panelists. I'll be happy to share your questions with the panelists throughout the forum. Uh, any certified crop advisors joining us today are eligible to receive their continuing education units for their participation in the forum. This event is also an OSCIA recognized knowledge sharing event, KSE, for Ontario farmers with the On-Farm Climate Action Fund projects in the nitro nitrogen management or cover cropping categories. So if that applies to you, either of those, the certified crop advisor or the knowledge sharing event, please have your smartphones ready to scan the QR codes after we hear from our opening speakers. So we'll, at this point, I would like to welcome Dr. Angela Strathoff, the program director at OSCIA. Over to you, Angie. Thanks, Bronwyn. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just want to extend a warm welcome as we kick things off. I really want to thank Wilton Consulting Group for their help in planning the forum and for their moderation of today. Uh, I want to thank Madeline Rodrigue with OSCIA for her tremendous efforts in coordinating the events this morning. And of course, I'd like to thank you, um, those of you joining us today from your home offices or office offices. Uh, it's great to have you online to learn more about On Farm's achievements. And welcome to the On Farm Climate Action Fund participants. It's great to see synergy between uh, these two programs. We have a lot of information uh, that I'm sure everyone will appreciate. So let's dive into an overview of On Farm and why it brings us all here today. OnFarm is a four-year initiative that was developed by OMAFRA, delivered by the Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association, and it's focused on soil health and water quality across the province. It's funded by the Canadian Agricultural Partnership, a federal provincial territorial initiative meant to strengthen the agriculture and agri-food sector. OSCIA has partnered with five conservation authorities, many of whom you'll hear from later this morning, uh, and the Soil Resource Group, who will also be presenting today. And the content and objectives and deliverables of the program um, were advised the past few years by our technical working group, and the knowledge translation and transfer objectives were driven by the stakeholder engagement working group. So we've had really active and fantastic and, and broad spectrum participation from across the agricultural industry um, as we've delivered this program the last few years. It was meant to continue work that was established under the Great Lakes Agricultural Stewardship Initiative, uh, looking at water quality in the Lake Erie uh, water basin. And it advances research priorities that the province identified in the 2018 Ontario Soil Health and Conservation Strategy. OnFarm is built on three essential pillars. Um, the first being water quality. That's where we prioritized and designed uh, experimental sites to continue monitoring and modeling uh, surface water movement and nutrient loading in priority sub watersheds in the Lake Erie and Lake Huron water basins. 
We established in-field paired trials to identify critical soil health indicators that allow us to test the effectiveness of best management practices that farmers are implementing uh, at 25 paired trial sites on real working farms across the province. And finally, it had a critical component of engagement. This is where we knew that despite all the best efforts of the researchers and the farmers in uh, in generating results, they're only as good as uh, the ability you have to share those results with the public and with the industry. Um, so we relied on our stakeholder engagement working group uh, and our communications networks to share the results of the program at events such as the one this morning. Um, and we did want the farmers participating uh, to really feel like a part of a, of a bigger and critical network. Um, so the, the conservation authorities, soil resource group, and especially the cooperating farmers have really been uh, the crux of the success of this program the last few years. So with that brief intro, I will now turn it over uh, to Assistant Deputy Minister Kelly McAslin from the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, Food Safety and Environment Division, who we're really pleased to have joined us this morning to say a few words about the program. Kelly? Great. Thank you so much. And good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, inviting me today to kick off this annual forum. I think this is an excellent opportunity to learn about the, the latest on-farm findings around soil health and water quality, but also to share ideas about environmental stewardship in general. Um, so the on-farm program is, is obviously key uh, for our ministry and really supports many of our ministry priorities, uh, including, for example, Ontario's agricultural soil health and conservation strategy, as well as the Canada Ontario Lake Erie Action Plan. So this is a, this is a really important program for us. Uh, and we know the program provides evidence to motivate further adoption of water quality and soil health best management practices through that on-farm knowledge sharing and really complements efforts from all of you, uh, the farmers, landowners, conservation authorities, governments, and non-government organizations to increase adoption of these critical best management practices. So under the program, there are 32 farm sites uh, throughout various regions of Ontario that have implemented these best management practices to investigate impacts on soil health and crop yields. And seven of these sites are actually also investigating the impacts on water quality and reducing, reducing nutrient loading to surface water as well. So some great learnings that will come uh, from these. Um, there's, there's many different best management practices used at these sites, including cover crops, tillage management, and or organic amendments, just to name a couple of them. Um, a little over a year ago, I was uh, fortunate to be invited and visit one of the water quality sites, uh, which is the Huron View Demonstration Farm just outside of Clinton. Many of you uh, may be familiar. And that's managed by Osbill Bayfield Conservation Authority. So it was a, it was a great experience. And at this uh, visit, I was able to see the innovative drainage practices, such as the contour and control drainage system being um, used at the site. Um, it was a really informative uh, visit. It was really obvious to me that a significant amount of work and dedication goes into both managing and collecting um, monitoring data from each of these demonstration sites. <clears throat> Another takeaway from the visit was the um, that there's such established partnerships at each one of the on-farm sites, and that's just critical to the success of these performance trials and really understanding how the best management practices can be integrated to improve soil health and water quality for uh, farmland here in Ontario. So uh, I and I know all of you are looking forward to seeing more of the uh, program results from, um, from on-farm and understanding the lessons learned, because this will also help uh, us in AMAFRA be more informed um, as we develop further environmental stewardship programs and we'll be taking all this into account. So I want to just take the opportunity to thank um, all the collaborators of the on-farm program. So to our delivery partner, uh, OSCIA, the participating conservation authorities, um, our third-party contractors, such as the Soil Resources Group, and also a big thank you to um, the farm cooperators whose participation has been just critical to the success of the overall program. Um, without all of your involvement on farm would, would not be the success that it is today. So again, I just wanna thank you for being here. Here in Amafra, we're very committed to the on farm program and um, uh, really excited for uh, the day today. So thanks again. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Kelly. It's great to see OMAFR's ongoing support for on -farm, uh, the on-farm project and the, the recognition that you really have to look at these things at a farm by farm level and working with farmers with the pra practical side of things of how it actually works at the farm level. So really great to see that. And thank you for joining us this morning. Great. And at this point, I'm going to welcome back Dr. Angela Strathoff to the virtual stage to uh, um, tell us more about the on-farm highlights. So Angie, back over to you. Great, thanks Bronwyn. Um, so I really like this, this visual map of, uh, of all the on-farm trial sites because it really shows the, the breadth of what we're trying to capture both at the soil health and the water quality sites. So uh, that's priority sub watersheds uh, in the orange dots um, and the yellow sites are our soil health trials and I mentioned earlier the enhanced demonstration sites that we've established as part of the program as well you can see their locations uh, in green four on-farm sites were selected by members of the on-farm stakeholder engagement working group and technical working group to become these long-term demonstration sites. And their selection criteria included their location in the province, the soil type, uh, the best management practice that was being tested at their site and the efficacy of that treatment, uh, and the cooperator's commitment to long-term research and their experience with on-farm research and participation in other research uh, networks. So we selected uh, Henry Denotter down in Essex County, Tyler McBlain in Brant, Brett Israel, just outside of Guelph in Wellington County, and Norm Lamoth in uh, Central Ontario and Peterborough. And as a result of establishment of the enhanced demonstration sites, On Farm has successfully leveraged collaboration and investment to enhance outreach and engagement activities with like minded programs, organizations, and businesses, including the federal program Living Labs, the Ontario Soil Network. St. Clair Region Conservation Authority, and various seed and crop and agronomic input businesses uh, in the regions local to the enhanced demonstration sites. Um, we're also excited to announce that Woodley Farms uh, via Norm Lamoth was recently selected to participate in an electric tractor trial facilitated by OSCIA that will roll out this summer. On the next slide, uh, you can see a sampling of the events uh, that OSCIA was able to host throughout the summer of 2022 and fall. Uh, we hosted 10 in-person on-farm demonstration events at 10 different cooperator sites. Uh, these ranged as far from Essex to Renfrew County. Uh, and in total, we had 346 participants at these events. They included farmers, academics, government representatives, certified crop advisors, non-governmental organizations, and conservation authorities, uh, and also several representatives from agribusinesses. They were really successful, and it was very gratifying to see everyone come out and, and participate. And five of these events also benefited from the presence of OSCIA's new mobile soil technology suite. Uh, you can see that in the top left photo uh, on the slide there now. And that really enhanced knowledge transfer by allowing participants to uh, see results of research um, alongside uh, kind of deep dives into the soil pits that the soil resource group was able to establish. So it was a really effective tool um, that we'll continue using moving forward. On the next slide, I want to take the opportunity to introduce you to the on-farm research guidebook. Uh, OnFarm does strive to make applied research more accessible. So to that end, we created an introductory guide to on-farm research that's available online. And Madeline, I see, has just popped the link into the chat. Thank you. Um, this was assembled uh, along with advice from experienced on-farm researchers like Jennifer Dolman and Greg Hannum from Woodrow Farms. Uh, so it's very practical and, and really stays true to the spirit of the on-farm program, which is unique in that it cooperates and centers the farmer's questions and management types and the equipment that they're already using into the trial design at the onset of the program. Guidebook users will learn how to develop an on-farm research question, design a trial, collect and analyze their own data, and interpret results in order to make management decisions on their own operations. So I really encourage you to, to take a moment and refer to the guidebook when you have the chance. Uh, 
We've also developed a series of case studies where you can learn more about nine of the on-farm cooperators and what's going on at their trials and, and what their intrinsic motivation to participate in soil health research is. On the next slide, uh, I'll take a moment to introduce you to the achievements we made under Operation Pollinator. Uh, this is a partnership we struck with Syngenta Canada. Uh, Operation Pollinator is an international biodiversity program run by Syngenta, which helps restore pollinators in agricultural landscapes by creating essential habitats. The program provides farmers with the opportunity to redirect one to two acres of land that they've considered lower in production. Uh, and use that land to establish pollinator-friendly habitats for bees and other insects. So this is increasing biodiversity on their farm, um, and we believe that has links to positive soil health impacts as well. OSCIA has been delivering Operation Pollinator since 2018 on behalf of Syngenta, but what was unique about the 2022 program uh, is we offered it exclusively to the existing network of on-farm cooperators. And this was identified as an opportunity to uh, engage with some leading farmers in Ontario who we already know are uh, generally supportive of soil health and water quality and interested in biodiversity achievements on farm as well. So we currently have seven on-farm cooperators uh, enrolled in the program, and throughout 2023, we'll be filling that uh, that to bringing that total to 10, um, and continuing our partnership with Syngenta to monitor those sites when possible. It's been a really gratifying partnership. And the next slide uh, is a very exciting tool that. Uh, that OSCIA has developed. Um, and I really want to uh, commend the efforts of James Cover at Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association for, for pulling this tool together uh, and encourage you to visit it now. I think the link has also just been popped into the chat. The data dashboard uh, assembles the data that's been collected from the 25 best management practice trial sites uh, over the past several years. And in, as you can imagine, it's a it's an ambitious data set. Um, so there's lots of different variables to select from. This tool was launched uh, at the forum one year ago, um, and it used baseline data from the first uh, uh, season of uh, the trials as they were established. But now we've had the opportunity to build in the data as the treatments have been applied. Um, so I'd really encourage you, it's a, it's a public space that anyone can access uh, um, and explore the on-farm data um, and really choose the, the, the treatments and the um, indicators that are relevant to you and your operation. So the cover crop trial data and the 2022 field data was recently added um, and is currently available on the website. You can filter by planting method or cover crop composition or month, or again, really use the um, elements of interest to your own operation to explore the dashboard. And finally, I just want to make a comment on, on more broadly what on-farm has achieved and, and where on-farm is headed. We're incredibly proud of what we've been able to accomplish and learn over the last four years. Um, we had all of the challenges of, of alongside the typical challenges of applied research in fields and the weather and timing and access to resources. Uh, we had the pandemic layered on top of that that challenged our ability to engage with the farm community. But I think we've really come out um, the other side and, and have established a really, really province-wide beneficial program that people are enthusiastic about. And I think that's really a testament to the commitment of the on-farm cooperators and an indication of the, the clear appetite that there is for this type of information in the landscape. So we're really hoping to uh, continue asking these questions, engaging with our partners, um, and looking to the future to how we can learn more about these practices and indicators. And, and really complete the picture that we've started establishing under the first few years of on-farm. Um, so with that, I think I'm turning it over to Jennifer Dolman. Uh, Jen is joining us from 
Renfrew County, uh, she, where she is a farmer, a certified crop advisor, a beekeeper, uh, and obviously an on-farm cooperator. She's also a member of the on-farm stakeholder engagement working group and an operation pollinator participant. And she plays active roles in her local soil and crop improvement association, uh, Ontario Federation of Agriculture and Crane Farmers of Ontario as well. So I'm convinced there's secretly two of her because I don't know how she actually does it all. Um, but we're really pleased to have her online this morning and I'll turn it over to her now. Thanks, Jen. Hi, Angie. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Um, and uh, I know actually there's not two of me. I actually simply have uh, a very dirty house. So, uh, so part of this is just admitting I have a problem, but there's just so many amazing things to participate in. It's, it's hard to pick. Uh, so thank you again for the opportunity for me to talk about this today. This has been a really interesting experience for our family and our farm operation. Um, so I guess they asked me to kind of talk about why I wanted to participate in the on-farm program to begin with. And uh, there was a few reasons. One was selfishly, I wanted to learn some more information from my farm operation. Having impartial data collected um, regarding my own practices is a really nice benefit. Uh, the other thing is, is I wanted to be able to access resources that otherwise wouldn't be available in my community. So it's great that we have all these conservation authorities and these other things going on, but I'm in, a far, I'm in an area that has no conservation authority and we do have water quality issues, but we're not on the Lake Erie watershed. So for me, this was a great opportunity to connect and bring resources to an underserviced community. Uh, plus, selfishly, it's just really nice to see a map that goes beyond Toronto, uh, east and north. I look forward to when they can have something like this in northern Ontario. So thank you to Omafra and all the stakeholders that made this happen. What makes on-farm a great strategy, I think, like separate from other, other research projects is that this is incredibly farmer friendly. As cooperators, we were able to sit down with the researchers ahead of time and go over our existing management. It, they helped us plan a research layout that worked for our existing equipment and our workloads. It's a very practical approach. It's, I would say it's kind of like reverse engineering research as I normally think of it. It also gives us confidence in the findings. You know, it's not like we had to make a square peg fit a round hole. This is, this is exactly what we do on our operations. And I'm a beekeeper, so I'm going to use a beekeeping pun, and that is it allows for cross-pollination. By having the researchers actually out on the farm, seeing the conditions we work with and the barriers we face, and then having us meet with the researchers and understand why it's so important that we take a little bit of extra effort so that we can get better data is really valuable. Um, and, and again, it just it allows for efficient management. The, the hub or the, the connections really allowed for, for example, we had Scott Banks come up and do a lot of the regular things. And then when Don came up, he would do the circuit. So it was a very efficient way to do things. Uh, there were some unexpected benefits for participating in the on-farm program. One of them was accountability. And as Angie has, uh, has illustrated, I am a very busy person. So I try to be a good record keeper, but it often ends up in a pile on my desk or lost in an inbox. So um, thankfully Scott was very tactful in asking me to get him information. And it was really good to keep me on track because it helped bring up the rest of my management. Um, I got better buy-in from the farm team after this. Uh, when you have people coming to your farm and you can get data um, it kind of helps us with our decision making process. It takes the emotion out of it. Also, when you're hosting field days, it kind of puts a little bit of pride and pep in the step of everybody to, to have the farm looking great because we know that our neighbors are coming to visit. Um, and then the last thing is we created a pearl. A pearl is a precious, precious um, gem. And uh, it just it doesn't come from just any ordinary oyster. It takes a grain of sand. So I would say the on-farm trial in our business was a grain of sand. Um, we did biosolid application on our fields. And in the second year, of course, the facility that, that did it out of the city of Gatineau was broken. So I was like, how do I do this when I don't have the, the ingredients that I need to do the trial? So I reached out to the OMAFRA staff who put me in touch with another supplier. And now actually, besides biosolids, we actually have a regular business relationship with this person. Um, Madeline and her farm team, and Angie talked about this in the introduction. Um, thanks to On Farm, we got the mobile technology uh, suite out to Eastern Ontario for her, her maiden voyage. So that was really exciting um, for people to get a chance to come and see. 
Uh, and the last thing was, is so we were hosting the on-farm trial and we wanted a guest speaker, but the guest speaker we wanted wasn't available because there's a lot of interesting things going on. So I reached out to Karen Thompson, uh, who's part of our stakeholder group for on-farm, and she put me in touch with Jenny at DGI Drones. And Jenny, you can see the drone here in the picture, Jenny came and she and her partner, uh, they did uh, a demonstration of cover crop rye into the standing corn. And I was a skeptic, this wasn't gonna work in Renfrew County, we're too far north, it's, the clay is too heavy. Um, but you know, they were coming to do a demonstration, we'll just have them do it. Well, you can see this little lad here in the picture, his dad was actually my cover crop seed supplier. And, uh, and so he came to deliver the seed that day. And thanks to that, not only did I get a great catch of rye that I didn't expect to get, uh, now my supplier has invested in a drone and I can hire him to do my custom application of my cover crop seed this coming year. So all thanks to just wanting to do a soil health experiment to see if organic amendments were worth it. So I just thought it's kind of neat to see how this, this rolls forward. And the best thing is, and I'm excited to see that there's continuing sites going forward because as farmer cooperators, we understand that on farm is really just a starting point and that the impacts of better soil health and water quality are, met, are measured over the long term. So thank you again for this amazing opportunity. It's been it's been a lot of fun. Amazing. Thanks, Jen, for that update on uh, your participation as a cooperator in the on-farm project. It sounds uh, I love the analogy of the pearl. So thank you for that. Um, so we're going to turn now and dig into some of the actual research findings, which will be fun. Uh, so we have, we're going to explore the key on-farm findings related to soil health indicators. And before I introduce our speakers from the Soil Resource Group, also known as SRG, I'd like to encourage participants to post any questions you have in the chat. I see some already coming in, which will be great. So we'll have an opportunity to get to answer these questions in the panel discussions that follow. And I would also encourage uh, any of the panelists, speakers, scientists, participants, if you see a question there that you wanna answer, uh, please go ahead and answer the questions in the chat as well as we go through our morning together. We'll, we'll be capturing the whole chat conversation as part of our report. So, um, so feel, feel free to use that. Um, great, so now I'd like to introduce Don King. Don is the president and senior agronomist at SRG. And I will also introduce Margaret Riby, who is the natural resource scientist at SRG. Welcome Don and Margaret and over to you. Thank you, Vana. Good morning, everybody. SRG is uh, very appreciative to be partnering with OSCIA in delivering the soil health monitoring component of the on-farm study. Uh, there's a number of us on the team that will be presenting some of the key findings this morning. And I'm going to start off with an overview of the study approach uh, before getting into some of the results. Soil health measurements were taken at all of the sites uh, within the on-farm uh, network, um, including those within the Pryder sub watersheds that uh, we're going to hear more about later this morning. But the 25 soil health BMP trial cooperator sites will be our focus, and these were established at five uh, at field sites across the Ontario in five regions uh, of distinct soils um, and prominent soils and landscapes. So these sites were selected to meet the goals of the study outlined in the approach uh, to better the understanding of the BMP's impact on soil health regionally and at field scale. Looking at a number of biophysical uh, aspects, including different soils, different drainage classes and landscapes, looking at different management conditions, uh, under reduced tillage, dominant field crops primarily, and livestock uh, sectors as well as looking at the degradation types across these conditions. The cooperators who were our research partners in this had side-by-side -side field plots where they compared their own business as usual uh, with BMP treatments that fit within their system and also their own soil health goals. Our job was to measure the soil health, starting with a baseline assessment and measure the changes over time under these different conditions and treatments. So our analysis included, of course, what we found from the soil degradation of these different sites, um, what existed, what soil health tests um, provided, and what BMPs um, had an impact on these soil health levels, as well as the cost benefit of implementing these BMPs. And throughout this, we're looking at a test of sampling tests uh, that are looking at 
um, how well they work across Ontario-specific conditions. To us, it really boiled down to answering some of the key questions in the current understanding. Firstly, what's the nature and extent of the problem? Uh, how much degradation and what form exists across the province? How reliable are the soil health tests in capturing this? And from that, what BMPs work the best to improve soil degradation? What indicators are most sensitive to show those changes? How long would it take for those to be uh, shown? And certainly looking at what level of BMP implementation has to uh, meet those different levels of degradation to show some improvement. So to evaluate these questions over the three years of the study, the cooperators managed their plots primarily in, in a three crop rotation, which is a, considered a good management practice to begin with, from soils, uh, for, probably, pardon me, from cereals to corn to soybeans uh, was the, the, the prominent uh, rotation. And uh, sites were selected, as you can see in year one that had uh, mostly cereals and that provided the time and the opportunity for farmers to, uh, to implement these BMPs such as cover crops and organic amendment application across these sites. There were cover crop combinations, of course, and different sources of organic amendments where the cooperator was comfortable um, using them within their system. And beyond the, the nine livestock farmers, there was just as many cash crop operators that source different biosolids or types of manure to include in their rotation as well. Although the cooperatives had proven success in using BMPs already, there were lots of opportunities for first time experiences. As Jen has pointed out, things like drone interseeding, um, biostrips or 60 inch corn with cover crops uh, were some of the things that were tried. Um, cooperators were, were recommended to be selected. First of all, that were already under a reduced tillage management. So you can see the high uh, prevalence of that. And that allowed us to focus more on those other BMPs. The measurements themselves, there's a package um, that was under uh, investigation by, by the research community. And they included chemical and physical and biological measures that were uh, considered more sensitive to changes in management. In addition to those, there's a number of field measurements um, that could be related to the measurements found in the lab. And important among those were the detailed soil pedology investigations conducted at each of the reference sampling locations. Uh, and that identified the existing soil health risks within the profile in identifying soil structure and problems that um, Ted Taylor here pointing to in the picture. Um, it uh, provides a greater understanding of the, the soil health interpretation at a site. At each location, the plot design was, was followed pretty much the same where we identified three contrasting soil and landscape units in a field. They offered uh, different in uh, position, uh, soil drainage class, and often different soil types. The locations of sampling were in these zones and, and each of the treatment strips that were aligned over top of these um, with respect of the cooperator's equipment and so on. Um, these sampling points we are referring to as uh, our benchmarks. So the BMP treatments always included a cover crop and most often compared that to an organic amendment application and an additional combination. The soil health assessment was completed at each of these benchmarks and the soil health indicator uh, sampling included composite sampling in triplicate at each location. So this is important because it allowed us for statistical comparison between not only the treatments, but also between the soil landscape zones and to determine where there was a combined effect of both the treatment and the position on an indicator. This is an example of a baseline assessment that was completed at each of the benchmarks. Uh, and this is, uh, allows us to relate the condition of the soil with the soil health indicator test results. So the table is broken into two halves. And so the left side is really the description of the soils. And on the right side are some of the measure results from the main package of indicators. So there's three rows, um, there's three different landscape positions represented here with uh, contrasting um, physical degradation levels. So the right side shows a colored collection of cells there, and those are um, uh, the rating classes that we use within the Cornell's Comprehensive Assessment of Soil Health. We don't have one in Ontario yet, um, but you'll see when we relate the observations in the field, 
uh, with some of the results from those indicators. Um, the, the tests may differ, whether they are good or bad, green being good and red being bad. Um, but even within a test itself, you see there's sometimes not that much differentiation between uh, these different levels of uh, soil condition. So to further evaluate these indicators from, from the test results across the province, uh, we're going to look at um, how these tests uh, in broad terms differ across the province, the responsiveness, uh, what are the factors that influence these indicator values, um, the variability we find from sampling within the location. And then Margaret's going to go into some more detailed uh, analysis of the results first at a case study, as well as looking at the, um, the BMP impact on sites across the province. There'll be a little bit further discussion too on the practicality of the use of these things um, in the panel discussion that follows. So this provides, uh, I guess, a, a sense of the density of the data that we've been collecting. This is for one year. Um, this is uh, showing the or organic matter levels that were measured at, at all of our benchmark and triplicate sample locations, um, the total over 900 points in, in a single year. Uh, but it does show that there's a strong correlation with um, active carbon and organic matter. Um, but to get an idea how different factors such as the level of degradation or an operation type or a region might influence these indicators, I'm going to go uh, through three examples. So this first one is a sandy loam site, which you'd expect to be at the lower end of the organic matter range. But you'll notice that uh, this site that has uh, a gravelly degraded ridge from past tillage and water erosion shows that those levels of the indicator are below that average, below that average blue line. So we are picking up those differences uh, based on that uh, aspects of, of that site. Another one is, is moving up the, the organic matter levels at a medium textured silt loam soil, uh, but it has a history of manure in the production cycle. And you can see that those indicators are moving above that average, as you see, in, as a, in a heightened level. So again, um, based on operation type, we're able to see differences. And thirdly, at the upper end, this is a group of Eastern Ontario sites. So certainly indicating a, a regional effect. And for those who aren't as, as familiar in general, this area uh, tends to have more clays, uh, but in its history, it was heavily forested, had a shorter time under cultivation with more livestock and pasture in its history, cooler conditions than in the Southwest, and that results in higher baseline soil organic matter levels. So three examples of how soil type and le level of degradation differ, how operation type, such as a livestock-based operation may differ, and how these indicator values may vary by region. So when considering how an indicator may vary, the range and distribution certainly appears to be site specific. There's lots of uh, uh, indication that these indicators relate to organic matter um, and some re respond differently than others. And so certainly active carbon had a strong relationship, SLAN as well, or uh, Salvita's labial amino nitrogen test as well as uh, ACE protein, uh, which is another nitrogen test. So in, uh, in looking at how uh, these indicators relate to, to soil organic matter, and, and we're using this as a reference because it really is the foundational measure for soil health. Um, but there was a clear separation between the soil health indicators uh, in, in contrast to the active carbon at one end, uh, tests such as um, potentially mineralized nitrogen indicated a lower level of correlation. Certainly we're finding at a site, there's lots of differences um, based on soils or position. We found differences from year to year. And we're not sure what that might be from weather or even there's a crop effect. Site management history has played a certain a role in manure and maybe even having fence rows where they, they were years and years ago. Um, but when we look at testing within uh, a benchmark area, those triplicate samples, and we look at the variability just within those triplicates, you can see again, uh, there's a lower variability with the tests such as Salvita CO2 burst or ACE protein compared to um, at the other end, uh, tests such as SLAN or potentially mineralizable nitrogen. So this kind of evaluation uh, of how indicators may vary is, is critical for us in providing confidence in their use in determining whether a measurable change over time can be shown. Ideally, 
monitoring a soil health indicator test over time would be a, a straight line. It'd be responsive and consistent and measurable uh, year after year. But what may be happening is more of a, a squiggly line and that uh, variations in an indicator may have years where they may go up or may they may not change overall. Um, but with time and as um, practices get established, um, the carbon and nitrogen dynamics start to occur, um, you will see this trend of increase over time. So where we are in on-farm monitoring is still at this lower end and more time is needed to, to better understand the impact of these BMPs. Uh, and so now Margaret's gonna take a closer look at this and how the landscape and these BMP treatment effects influence the indicator findings with a case study and grouping some of the sites across the province. Okay, so we're going to look at uh, one of the 25 sites in detail, and this was site 12, uh, Hanum site, and as you can see here, this is an aerial uh, imagery of the soybean crops. So you're seeing a little bit of variability there in the crop's maturity, and of course that's going to have um, implications. So if we look at uh, what the background assessment was at this site, there was uh, many of the benchmarks showing moderate to severe tillage erosion. Uh, there was significant losses of one to two soil uh, horizons at some of these benchmarks. And of course, the uh, soil health indicators were reflecting those, uh, those losses. So what happened at the site uh, when in 2020, when we established the site, there was winter wheat uh, followed by soybeans. And then in 2022, uh, you see that corn, uh, corn crop. So in terms of the BMPs that were established in the fall of 2020 after wheat, there was a cover crop established in a strip. There was an organic amendment strip. And then there was that combination strip that Don was talking about where there was both organic amendment and the cover crop. Uh, the following September in 2021, there was a cover crop planted after soybeans and then pre-plant corn, uh, they came in with another compost application in that organic amendment plot and the combination treatment strip. So what did we measure? Um, so we're going to present three of the indicators that we measured. Uh, so starting with organic matter, because that's really the most common measurement of soil health that we use uh, right now. So if we look at this uh, graph, we see organic matter on the y-axis and the treatments uh, strips on the x-axis over the three years. So what you are seeing likely is that 2020 baseline year uh, with a higher level of organic matter. So we're seeing that data shifting over the three years, and that is not um, an uncommon response to these indicators. And Don mentioned some of that variability, why we're seeing that those, uh, why we might be seeing some of these uh, indicators changing from year to year, or even within a year. So if you look closely and focus it on that blue line, that was our 2020 year. So that's our two, uh, 2022 year, I'm sorry. That's after two years of BMP. One might suggest that that organic amendment strip and the combination strip resulted in higher organic matter levels. So what we need to do is determine if that's real. And because we have that triplicate sampling, we can do a statistical analysis to see is that real. So first of all, we're, we're looking here at the um, analysis in 2022 or 2020, it's a baseline year before we applied treatment, we investigated, was there a difference that existed already in those strips? And the answer was no. So then in 2022, after two years of those BMPs back to back, did we see a change in organic matter? And if you look at that last column, you'll see that the organic amendment and the combination treatment resulted in statistically higher organic matter than the check. Okay. Part of the covariate analysis is, though, to determine if it was a landscape and a treatment interaction that is causing that effect. And the covariate analysis told us that in this case, there was an interaction. So how does the landscape play a role in this response? So here we have the 2020 organic matter data. And what that was used for in the covariate analysis was a measurement of background variability. So where we were in 2022 was uh, compared to where we started in 2020. So what we can see here is that the 2022 data, we see those are the data points that we're looking for differences at a benchmark scale. So at the bottom, we see that 
indeed, after two years, we had a statistically higher organic matter in the lower landscape position in that combination treatment, as well as at the mid landscape position in any of the treatments that received organic amendments. So keep that in mind, we're having that mid landscape effect in organic matter. So if we look at Solvita, which is often reflecting the microbial activity of the soil. Again, we have that on the y-axis. We have the indicator, uh, the treatments over the three years on the x-axis. And we can see in this data, there's not a lot of variability there. There's not a lot of range. It's about a 5 ppm difference between treatments and between the years. So we're not, we, we, one might suggest that this indicator maybe isn't very responsive, but let's see what the statistics say. So again, we have that 2020 baseline data. There were no differences in the strips before we applied our treatments. And then after two years of those BMPs, we are seeing that the combination treatment is statistically higher in Sylveta CO2 than the check. Again, the covariate analysis at this site told us that the landscape actually plays a role in this, um, this response. So we need to look more closely at that benchmark positioning. So again, here's the 2020 data. That was our foundational data that we use in the covariate to, um, in, to consider the variability that existed pre-treatment. And then we have our 2022 data, which is what we were looking at to see if those differences exist at the benchmarks. And so at the very bottom, we see that the cover crop strip actually had a statistically higher Solvita CO2 burst than the check at that lower landscape position. Interesting. But what's most interesting to me was that that mid landscape position, all the treatments are resulting in a statistically higher solvita than the check. So those treatments were generating a response at that mid landscape position where we we're seeing some moderate degradation. Lastly, we're going to look at the active carbon and what it really is measuring is the general soil productivity. So active carbon on the y axis again this treatment strips on, on the x and you're seeing a little bit of variability here happening in this data, a little bit of a range difference between the years. Again, we're, we're used to seeing that in these indicators after three years of this data set. But if you really zone in on that 2022 line, the blue line, what you see is there's quite an increase in that organic amendment strip and the combination strip from the check. So again, is that real? We have to check the statistics. Looking at those treatment strips in 2020, there were no differences in active carbon before we put our treatments on those strips. Uh, but then after two years, we are noticing that any of the organic amendment treatments, and so the organic amendment themselves and the combination resulted in a statistically higher active carbon than the check. And that was just after two years of those BMPs. Again, though, we know that at this site, the analysis told us there is a landscape effect. So let's take a look at that at the benchmark scale. So there's that 2020 data as the uh, variability data in that first year. Then we look at the 2022 data. That's where we're looking for the differences after two years. And we see, okay, so we have that lower uh, landscape position in the strip four combination is statistically higher in active carbon than the check. But again, we're seeing that mid landscape position responding to those BMPs after just two years. So um, just to recap, we are consistently seeing that mid landscape position responding after just those two BMP years. Um, but what would be interesting is with continuing these BMPs and continuing monitoring, we'd be able to indicate how long it would take to change these indicators at that most degraded upper landscape position. So we've shown you a couple of the indicators. Let's look at the yield. So we can see that there's a huge variability in the yield at the site, uh, 200 bushel corn to 17 bushel corn at those uppermost degraded landscape positions. So it's quite a range. Um, but if you remember those indicators, we didn't really have that kind of range in the indicators. So there are a lot of factors at any given site that are influencing yield. At this specific site, it would be pH and moisture. So what we're saying is that yield may not often be the best indicator of soil health. And we're certainly seeing that at this site and other sites in the on-farm project. So we have done this level of analyses for all 25 sites, but unfortunately we don't have the time to share that today. So what we are going to do is summarize that data for you across uh, all 25 sites. 
So if you recall at the Hanum site, most of those indicators were responding at a benchmark scale. So we had to look at that interaction within the covariate analyses. So what this site, this uh, slide is showing you are tables, uh, sorry, graphs that are uh, showing the uh, occurrence of the interactions. So we have the three um, indicators, organic matter, active carbon, and salvita, and then we have two different soil types. And why we've done that is um, we would often um, expect these two different soil types to behave differently. So of the 25 sites, there's about 50% of the sites in each of these given soil texture, broad soil texture groups. So if you look closely at the organic matter and the coarse soil types of the all the benchmarks that existed in the project, about a quarter of the time organic matter as the indicator was statistically higher in the uh, organic amendment and the cover crop and organic amendment strip from the check. So we have that positive response of those treatments of an, on organic matter. We're seeing a very similar trend in the fine soil types, but what's interesting is we're seeing more instances of cover crop resulting in a statistically higher organic matter than the check. We look at active carbon, it's about 20% of the time the active carbon indicator was resulting in a statistically higher um, level uh, in those BMPs than uh, BMP strips than the check. And again, the fine was behaving very similarly. And if you look closely, even at the organic matter and the active carbon, they're, they're trending very closely. Uh, the response is very similar. And um, as Don indicated before, in our data set, active carbon and organic matter are very well correlated. So looking at the solvita, though, uh, we're not seeing a, um, often that we're having any sort of an interaction or uh, those, those BMPs are not resulting in a response from the check when we're measuring solvita. And as I indicated before in the Hanum example, that uh, solvita indicator may be a little bit slower to pick up change um, in, in the, on the landscape. So within each of these strips, however, we do have prominent landscape positions that are responding differently. So uh, creating that, uh, that response different from the check, similar to Hannum's example, where that mid-landscape position was really where the action was happening. Um, however, that specific position and the nature of the difference from the check, whether it was positively different or negatively different, is uh, very site-specific. So uh, that was a little harder to roll up. If we look at the analysis, so the covariate analysis, we have that uh, interaction, and then we have just the treatment strip as, as a variable affecting soil health indicators, or just the landscape that can influence a soil health indicator. So of the benchmark, or of the um, responses that were not interactions, there were instances where treatment strip alone was influencing a soil health indicator. However, when that happened, it wasn't necessarily that the BMP treatment was different from the check. There wasn't very often that we saw that. However, there were instances where there were differences between treatments. And so that's something we look into. So if we look just specifically at cover crop, the active carbon uh, measurement in those cover crop strips was most frequently different from the check. So where there was a cover crop um, response, it was active carbon that was picking up that response. Um, however, that response, the active carbon was typically significantly lower in the cover crop check, the cover crop strip than the check. When we talk about the organic amendment treatments uh, just alone or the combination, the active carbon again and the solvita CO2 bursts were most frequently picking up that difference as being higher than the check. So those treatment strips alone, uh, in the cases where they were significant, those were the indicators that were picking up that difference from a check. Then, of course, there is the landscape position, and some of these sites had fairly dominant landscape positions, and that was the factor that was influencing an indicator. Not surprisingly, those mid and upper landscape positions more frequently resulted in a statistically lower value or indicator value than the lower landscape positions. And of course, that has to do with the level of degradation happening at those sites. So when bringing these findings uh, to uh, conclusion in a, a few bullet points, um, certainly I think from our observations at the different sites, soil landscapes um, uh, provide quite a, a contrast 
Um, but throughout our sites, we found that tillage erosion was a predominant form of soil, de soil degradation, uh, followed by uh, near surface soil compaction. So the data set is uh, representing a, a diverse collection of uh, information across sites in Ontario. It shows soil health indicator ranges that aren't always the same range as the US data reference that we, we have to use. Um, and the soil health indicators that were tested mostly reflected soil organic matter levels and differences in soil degradation. And the soil health indicators tend to correlate with each other, but there's at this point, no one best measure that we can suggest. In terms of recommendations from the work uh, so far, indicators um, certainly uh, uh, would suggest that soil organic matter is still an essential measure to use as a base. Active carbon shows promise in the short term and maybe SLAN. ACE protein shows some potential. Um, and the Solvita CO2 burst appears uh, responsive, but again, it's maybe slow to show those changes. Overall, the infield variability and the indicator consistency still requires some further testing. Although Margaret did indicate that uh, indicators are, are, some, are measuring some effect of EMP treatments, um, but in two treatment years, we're within one crop rotation and in times one or two treatments within their rotation, or year, um, it's really not been long enough to make some of those definitive conclusions. Increases in indicators are, are not going to be a straight line. I think we can say that, um, but we have to look for that trend uh, within a site. And lastly, on-farm data is uh, at an early stage of understanding this BMP uh, impact and soil health indicator evaluation across the province. And thank you. Uh, and to our on-farm cooperators who without this, uh, um, this would not be as successful or as enjoyable. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Donna and Margaret. That was very informative. And I think there's been a lot of questions in the chat that Angie's been fielding some of them, but uh, we'll follow up on those uh, with our panel hopefully as well. So with no further ado, because I know we've got this jam-packed agenda, I want to bring in our panel. We have um, we have Sebastian Billiard from OMAFRA, Luke Hannum, a grain farmer near Guelph and also an on-farm cooperator, Adam Hayes and Dr. Ann Huber, who are both with SRG. So I'll bring in the panel now. And just as everybody gets uh, settled in here, I'm going to start with Anne. And I'm losing my spot here. Anne, if you could tell us a little bit about what you think are the best indicators to track change in soil health over time. And when should farmers expect to start seeing changes and how often should they be soil sampling? And what are the costs involved with the soil testing? So a lot jam packed in there, but Anne, I'll turn it over to you to break that down a little bit. Hi, um, yeah, thanks. I think Don just completely stole my thunder by his last <laughs> slide, what he said. But at any rate, um, so just to reiterate, I think uh, we you need to measure soil organic matter. It's, it's the, uh, the keystone indicator for all of this. It underpins all of the soil health um, uh, work that we're doing and, and, uh, and what people are looking at. And, and so it's not very expensive. Um, and especially if you measure it with your, with your, um, with the rest of your soil fertility. So, so, so that is, you absolutely have to have that most, uh, a lot of farmers are doing that already. So that's not new. Um, as Don and Margaret have uh, pointed out, active carbon is where we've seen uh, probably most of the statistical responses or the most frequent statistical responses at this point. Um, but uh, again, as Don said, we're really early on in this piece. So, so it is slightly more responsive than, than uh, Solvita uh, respiration appears to be. Um, but, you know, we need another bunch of years, we need 10 years to, to really hone in on this, um, or at least five. And, and, and so with respect to nitrogen ones, they were a bit more variable. So SLAN and uh, PMN showed a fair bit of variability, uh, which is a bit of a challenge. ACE protein, which um, we have just started this year, 
and and we don't actually have quite all the data yet, but it's looking really promising in terms of, of uh, following um, uh, the soil organic matter at least. Um, and and so so it looks like it might be a good nitrogen one. Uh, with respect to the physical indicators uh, that we haven't talked about much yet, aggregate stability is really important. That's going to take time to change. So so you wouldn't expect a change in that, um, you know, for say ten years, but uh, or at least five to ten. But a, a grower can do that. There are apps, there are phone apps now for doing that. And so somebody can keep track of that um, even on their own, even without sending it to a lab. Um, and the same with bulk density. So those are important physical indicators, um, but you can keep track of those on your own. And the other thing I would say is that if you do a texture analysis at the beginning of your, your work, then you can use a calculation to look at your water holding capacity. And that's that's a really key thing in terms of, of risk management. Um, and so if you know your soil organic matter and your, your texture, your clay content, there is a calculation that you can do. And as of course you increase organic matter, um, you will increase that water holding capacity. So that's really important. Um, when do you expect to see changes? Uh, you know, really five to 10 years to see some consistent changes in some of these early ones. Uh, if you're looking at consistent changes in organic matter, we've seen a bit, but to, to see, to do regular soil sampling, you wouldn't really see that um, probably for, for 10 years. It would be the likely case to see consistent changes. So remember Dawn's wiggle graph, um, you get changes, but you're looking for consistent changes over time. So, so you need, we need a bit more time. Um, how expensive are they? Uh, so most of them, are in the $25 to $30 range. Some are a bit higher. PMN is higher, it's 40 because it's not quite as suitable for a lab, um, uh, at least in, in, in rapid flow through labs. Um, so, so yeah, so they vary. There's some that could be really, really expensive, but the basic ones are, are in that order of magnitude. And, and what I would say is that, um, what you do, whatever you're doing, do it the same all the time. So if you're looking at to see changes over five to 10 years, look within your rotation. So if you, um, for example, have a corn soy wheat rotation and you sample in the corn in June, then the next time you sample, you want to be in the corn in June again, um, would be is the ideal so that you're eliminating variables that that you know can creep in like what's the effect of, of crop uh, so so whatever you do do it the same every time if you want to sample in September then sample in September all the time and I and I suggest go to the same lab all the time too because tests vary a little bit um, so so yeah same time same location and same lab if you can um, perfect Great. Thank you, Anne. That was uh, helpful information. And that's a good segue into uh, Luke from Woodrill Farms. Can you share a little bit about, uh, as an on-farm cooperator and a busy active farm that Woodrill is, how you go about doing your soil sampling? Sure. Yeah. Um, we kind of have a six-step process at Woodrill for, uh, for taking soil samples. Uh, the first step in the process would be using our, uh, our dual EM sled to uh, measure the electrical conductivity of the soil uh, that kind of gives us a baseline of what there is for variability across the field it doesn't really give us uh, an indication of soil health but it does tell us that one area of the field is different than the other uh, or similar to another one uh, so we'll take that dual em data back and start uh, step two we look at that data uh, we compare it to topography maps uh, and then we, we use that to, to determine points of interest uh, that are high value where we can actually go take uh, a four foot soil core uh, with our, our soil probe machine. Uh, we, we take that four foot soil core into our, um, our soil lab and we will determine drainage class, soil texture and soil type. Um, then we can take the top six inches of that four foot soil core and send that away to a lab for, for nutrient and organic uh, matter analysis. 
then we take all that data, uh, combine it with on-farm data like uh, like the like yield maps and and inherent knowledge that we have as farmers to create uh, a, a soil map essentially. So we can take all that information and and boil it down to um, all these zones uh, have similar characteristics, so they must be the same soil type or they're a different soil type. So we can we can make a, a soil type map with all that data. Uh, and additionally, make uh, nutrient maps for phosphorus and potassium, soil organic matter maps, and then use all of that information in conjunction to uh, to make spatial decisions uh, for agronomic and management uh, reasons. Oh, great. So lots going on there. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Adam, I'll turn it over to you. So we heard from Luke that Woodrill uses a range of technology to assist with um, soil sampling. Can you provide an overview of basic tools and methods farmers can use if they're just beginning to measure their soil health? Yeah, there's, as been discussed, there's quite a number of ways to approach it. Um, I guess there's, if somebody's thinking about looking at it, I guess there's maybe three approaches that um, they could consider. One of them, you know, is hiring an agronomist to do um, the soil sampling. It may be the easiest for them to kind of figure out where to do the sampling, uh, maybe a little more cost, but um, has the potential for them to learn more, um, some of the advantages would be the you know the agronomist would know how to do the soil health sampling and um, <clears throat> how to do the take the samples and handle them to send to the lab. Um, they can also provide some guidance on where to take those samples and what ones um, they might want to use, uh, and maybe be helpful in interpreting the results of of the indicators uh, as well and maybe take some GPS reference points for coming back into the future to similar points to um, get that, have that reference point and carry forward. And the other thing, if that, um, if the agronomist uh, works with them to complete a soil health assessment or a farmland health checkup, then there's some more information there that can be added to the um, lab results to help verify and interpret um, the indicator uh, results. Um, the second approach, farmer can you know, do the samples um, themselves, uh, be a bit less costly, but um, they would be able to decide what, you know, they would have to decide what uh, it was they were going to sample and where they're going to sample um, for some of the decisions um, around that. Um, basically, you know, a, like uh, Luke said, using a lot of the information that you already have, um, organic matter levels, fertility information, crop information, um, and other, um, other layers that have been collected, certainly a good way of helping to figure out where. Um, if just from a simple approach, um, if you, you could just go out and take a sample at a representative uh, area of the field, that would give you a sense of um, what the soil health is in that field and um, help you know start to get an early understanding of what the indicators um, mean. Um, <clears throat> a little more than that, you could add a you know one or more poor areas along with the representative area to get an idea. Uh, the next step up would be you know something um, like what Luke was talking about. If you have zones established already, um, sampling within those zones and depending on your budget, um, you know, maybe sampling fewer of those depending on, on how much money you want to spend, but trying to get a sense of, of the uh, variability from there. Um, and then deciding on the indicators, certainly um, cost is a consideration, but uh, the ones that um, Anne talked about, organic matter for sure, um, aggregate stability is a good one, a good early one to get a bit of a baseline of where, where that's at. It's not going to change as much. Um, the active carbon and solvita, and then if you you know don't want to spend uh, very much money but want to um, <clears throat> you know learn more, um, there's certainly aggregate uh, stability with the apps or doing the slaking like we've done demonstrations of that in the past. Uh, using a penetrometer or a tile probe to do some soil compaction measurements, uh, water infiltration, 
just dig up a shovel full of soil and look at the structure and doing earthworm counts uh, is another option. And the managing for uh, healthy soils chapter in the OMAF or agronomy guide um, has a section there that describes how to assess some of these and as well as some others. So that can be a, a bit of a guide for that. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Adam. Um, that's good. Good tips there. And I just know that Sebastian, I'm going to turn to you because we know there's other work underway to improve the understanding of soil health across Ontario. So could you provide a brief overview, <laughs> emphasize brief, of the uh, soil health assessment and planning uh, program, the SHAP? And I think that came up in the chat earlier as well. So I think people are interested to know how that work under SHAP complements the work underway through on farm. So over to you, Sebastian. Thanks. Um, yeah, I won't give a full uh, explanation of, uh, of how SHAP works, because uh, that's for a different uh, session, maybe. But um, briefly, we, we, we have some of the same analytical indicators uh, and, uh, and have been uh, working with OnFarm to uh, make sure we're capturing some of that same uh, information. Uh, the, the other thing with, with SHAP, uh, you know, is that you can't know everything about soil health just from poking the ground and sending the soil to the lab. Uh, you know, it won't most, there's no lab test to tell you how much erosion you've had. Well, unless you're gonna measure radioactive isotopes and all that, but uh, uh, so so it, it includes some some additional modules uh, that uh, that get us soil health from different perspectives, like, you know, uh, degradation risks for erosion, or compaction, uh, and, uh, and some additional uh, evaluations that, you know, can't be done as, as well uh, or don't need to be done in a lab. Um, but then in terms of how it uh, supports this kind of work, I think the biggest thing uh, comes down to uh, uh, a thing that was mentioned uh, a few times here already in, in, in the interpretation. So um, as part of SHAP, we've done uh, sampling uh, of, uh, of a lot of soils uh, across Ontario farms. And uh, that combined, especially with uh, the good work of our soil survey colleagues and their uh, topsoil survey program, uh, they uh, went and measured uh, 500 uh, uh, farms and in, in the same way as on farm, looking at upper, mid and lower slope positions uh, to try to get at uh, and, and measuring uh, soil health uh, indicators as well. Uh, I think that is going to be the key in uh, the interpretation, which has always been an issue with soil health indicators. It's like, all right, I got 500 ppms of active carbon. Now what? You know what is like like what do you do with that information uh and uh and so i think in on farm you know they were using the uh, the, the cornell interpretation framework and and their their database uh their, their data set to, to be able to say okay that puts you more or less in in this percentile of uh of, of other farms with uh, similar soil texture uh, but we'll be able to do that in the future based on ontario data uh, because uh, ontario is not new york um, and uh, and yeah, I think I think the other thing is that data set uh, uh, and and combined with the work of on farm and other similar projects uh, to be able to to, to get at the uh, management recommendations from a more data driven approach. You know, uh, like we're starting to see with on farm here. Okay, we've got these different BMPs, and what's awesome about on farm is that also looking at the combination of those BMPs. But how does that affect these different indicators? So you know. If uh, I'm a farmer and I take a soil health test and I see that I have this result for, you know, PMN, uh, and that puts me in the uh, kind of bottom tier of uh, compared to similar soils in Ontario, well, what are the most effective BMPs to to address that? And, uh, you know, with, with this kind of work, uh, I think we'll be able to say, okay, at least, you know, similar farms on similar soils that included these practices they were able to uh, increase these uh, soil indicators and uh, hopefully then also the soil functions. Super. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, I have one question from the audience, uh, and I'll be looking at Adam first and Luke for a second for a comment, and then we'll be going to a break. So we're going to keep this as quick as possible, but I do want to get this question out there. Uh, it's probably hard to say at this point, but do you think high landscape positions, the most degraded, will need more management, for example, additional BMPs, or will they just take longer to respond? So Adam, if I could start with you, and then Luke, if you want to comment on that. Um, yeah, they're, they're going to need the <clears throat> more BMPs on them to bring help bring up their 
their soil health uh, levels. And it's um, from what we, Margaret was talking about, we were seeing a bit more response from the BMPs on those those areas, so it's <clears throat> excuse me important to um, uh, you know apply more BMPs to those. Um, but you know having the fertility and uh, organic matter information when you're doing that to make sure that you're not um, you're you know increasing organic matter if that's the goal and not um, you know getting excessive uh, nutrient levels there. Great, thanks. And Luke, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I I agree. Um... But I also think we need to be realistic in how we manage them. Um, so I, I don't think that we should look at it as managing them uh, differently or, or I, sorry, we should manage them differently, but we should be realist, realistic with, with expectations that uh, it's never going to be as good as the soil in the lower landscape positions. So we need to uh, to kind of go into that with our, an open mind. And um, I, I <laughs> sorry, I'm. At a loss for words here. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, yeah, so I, I actually heard a, an interesting comparison this week that um, I'll, I'll relate it back to swimming. I will never be Michael Phelps. Michael Phelps is a really good swimmer, and I can try and be a good swimmer, but I'll never be Michael Phelps. So as long as I'm realistic in my expectations that I'm not going to be Michael Phelps, I can still try to be a good swimmer, but I'm not going to be that good. So we can try and get our upper management or our, our upper position. Uh, soils to be as good as they possibly can be, but they're never going to be Michael Phelps. Um, so as long as we we're realistic with that and we try to manage it to our, our the best of our ability and, and do things differently than we would at the lower slope positions uh, to to try and overcome those things, but no, they're they're never going to be uh, the best soil they possibly can be, and that that really comes down to um, the pedology that. It's just a different soil type, so we need to we need to manage it differently than we would uh, those lower slope positions. Oh, great! I love that comparison to uh, Michael Phelps. So, something to keep in mind if you're feeling frustrated about the uh, upper soils. I guess <laughs> try to help them be as good as they possibly can be. That's great. Um, excellent. I just wonder if anyone wants a last uh, word or two. Any advice for farmers out there who are listening to this uh, session today on how to get started? So, just like. Anne had that same time, same place, same lab little quote. Does anyone else have a one sentence kind of piece of advice on getting started with soil uh, testing? Sebastian, I might uh, pick on you first. Oh boy. Um, <laughs> I think uh, what I'd say is uh, uh, consider the variability and uh, especially if, if you're trying to track something instead of just like throwing a number out there, uh, uh, pick your spot. And, and go back to it, make sure you know where it is, uh, because that can have, as we've seen, a, a big influence on uh, these indicators, even, you know, the more stable ones like soil organic matter, seeing that uh, uh, landscape variability can be, can be pretty big there. So uh, if you're trying to track things, make sure as much as possible that the things are the same between the two times. Great. Thank you, Sebastian. And did you want to add one last comment and then we'll take our uh break? Uh, yeah, I would just reiterate what what Sebastian said, um, and and uh, when you, yeah, benchmark your sample or benchmark GPS your benchmark, <laughs> um, and 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 take some really good samples if you really want to know. Even if if this is your baseline sampling, you know, do replicates. <clears throat> we did we did triplicates around. The benchmark but in three different areas as Don showed but if I were the farmer that's because we wanted to see what the variability was that that was our objective to see what that variability was but if I were the farmer what I would do would be to do you know maybe you know two or three composite samples around that benchmark so that you are really uh, getting rid of that very localized variability in in your samples if that makes any sense. So, so that your composite sample has kind of accounted for some of that very localized variability. And, and I think, you know, that will give you a somewhat uh, more consistent number. Uh, right. That wasn't our objective. Our objective was to see what variability looked like, but when you're doing your baseline sampling um, and you're gonna do it the same every time you, you sample, getting rid of some of that localized variability might be helpful. Excellent. 
thank you for that. And uh, I would encourage all of the four of you to check out the chat. They're having some good comments and questions in there that maybe uh, during the break or during the rest of the morning, you might want to jump in and provide some answers to those questions. And for anyone worried we are losing the chat, we're, we are capturing all of that and we will work it into our report. So uh, thank you to Angie and a couple other people who are uh, answering away in there. But uh, for all of you, Luke, uh, Sebastian, and Anne, and Adam, I'd encourage you to do the same if you have a few minutes. And thank you very much for joining us as panelists this morning and for sharing your insights on soil testing and everything to do with that. And with that, we will take a short break. Uh, we're actually a tiny bit behind on our schedule, but not too bad. So if we can all come back, it'll just be a six minute break and we'll come back at 1030 sharp. If everyone just wants to make sure you have your videos and uh, microphones off and go do what you need to do for refresh your coffee we'll join back at 10 30 sharp thanks everyone
All right, welcome back everybody. So now we will turn our uh, attention to exploring the key on-farm findings related to water quality indicators. Uh, we'll begin with a presentation from some of the participating conservation authorities. And as with the previous sessions on soil health, we encourage you to post your questions in the chat and we'll try and get to them as well as we can in the following the presentations. So we're now joined by three speakers. Tatiana Lozier is the Stewardship Services Coordinator at Upper Thames River Conservation Authority. Colin Little is the Agricultural Program Coordinator for the Lower Thames Valley Conservation Authority. And Chris Van Eastbrook is the Stewardship Coordinator at Maitland Valley Conservation Authority. And they are going to collaborate on a presentation. So I'll turn the microphone over to Tatiana first. Thanks, Bronwyn. I'm going to keep the uh, I'm going to just uh, say that Chris and Colin are going to join partway through the presentation, but I'll kick things off on behalf of the five conservation authorities here for the first few minutes. So on the next slide, Angie already covered the pillars of on farm, but I just wanted to reiterate highlight it in bold where the CAs fit into all three, but really coming from that water quality perspective. Uh, and then on the next slide. If you haven't joined us for the on-farm forum before, just a quick overview of the six sub-watersheds and where they're located. So we have Weigel Creek in Essex, Jeanette's Creek in Lower Thames, and both the North Kettle and Upper Medway Creek sub-watersheds, uh, which are monitored by Upper Thames, where I work out of. And then there's Gully Creek, the, which is monitored by the Asabo Bayfield and Garvey Glen by Maitland Valley. So each of the sub-watersheds is between 10 to 20 kilometers squared. So about 2,500 to 5,000 acres. So when you think about that in terms of the larger uh, content, in terms of the acres draining into both Lake Huron and Lake Erie, we're monitoring a really small fraction, actually about 0.04% of the land area, but we have really good coverage across the changing landscape. The next slide, just shows that within a relatively short driving distance between these sub watersheds, there's large variability in climate. So the average temperature being warmer in Essex with a longer growing season, precipitation differences between our sites. So not only when we think about the amounts of rainfall, but also snowfall and snow accumulation. So Essex and even Lower Thames don't get the snow that those of us east of Lake Huron do. So we have very different winters. Uh, the soil types are different, different not only between the subwatersheds, but within the subwatersheds as well. And we have topography differences as we move from a relatively flat Essex to more rolling topography up through Huron County. So across the five conservation authorities, we have people who have local knowledge of the landscapes that they work in. The next slide shows that where we are all similar is that we are all monitoring uh, in a similar fashion to get as accurate data as we can on nutrient loading in these subwatersheds. So we do this over what's referred to as a water year. So we look at October 1st to September 30th of, of the next year and do year round sampling. And we do mostly event-based sampling. So we use automated water samplers to capture as representatively as we can the rise, peak and fall of the water course. So you can see on the graph there, I have discharge with the dots representing sampling points. So we have high frequency sampling uh, to most accurately understand nutrient and sediment loading from these subwatersheds. The next slide, when we look at in terms of when we get losses from the subwatersheds, so this graph uh, shows the 2019-2020 water year, which is the same graph from the previous slide, in the upper Medway, which is just north of London, and in the orange box is the period between October and April, so the non-growing season. And you're probably familiar with the story when we talk about when we get ma majority of the phosphorus losses, looking at the pie graphs there, majority of total phosphorus and dissolved phosphorus being lost during the non-growing season, again, in the orange. But really the pattern holds true for sediment and nitrogen. So really all of our major water quality parameters are lost when we have the majority of water moving through the landscape. So we're losing a large amount of nutrients and sediment during this time. And then sticking with the same water year here, but if we start to move across our sub watersheds, we get the same pattern. 
So I just have total phosphorus graphed here, but really again, the non-growing season, those orange bars are the periods where we're getting the highest losses at our watershed outlets. And if you could just hit enter for me, I just wanted to quickly highlight from the upper Medway, the event from January, 2020, a little bit older now, but this is one of the largest events that we've monitored at this site. And we saw 1,055 kilograms of phosphorus lost in three days, and that's coming from 5,000 acres. So if I break down the math, that's about 0.53 kilograms per hectare or just under a uh, half a pound per acre. But to put that into context, if we look at the 2019-2020 total phosphorus load, it was 1.24 kilograms per hectare. So 43% of the total phosphorus load, just under half of all the loading for the year happened in three days. So during high flow events at this site, the water actually typically tops over the culvert there, which is the very bottom of that, that slide. And just to drive home how much water that is, it was during that event, it was equal to 450 Olympic sized swimming pools. So then, yeah, the next slide there just shows that we, we know that a majority of our losses occur during the non-growing season. We know it's these key events, these driving events, whether it's a, a single large rainfall, um, a single snow melt event that can make up a portion of our annual loads. So an event like, like today, you can all think about how much nutrients might be moving through the creeks as you pass by them at some point later today. But what we still need to dive into is this concept of variability between our sites and between years. So we know our watersheds are different. We get different loads between them. If we just look at the top graph, even just between two years of data across the sites are, are different in terms of annual loading. Uh, but even between the sites within years are different. And then the bottom graph just showing that even at one site, the, the loadings over multiple years are, are different. So just like the, the soil health indicators have landscape variability, so do our water quality sites. And this is where the conservation authorities can really work together and start to look at, at these different events. So are the driving events the same across all of our watersheds? Why does the magnitude of losses differ between our sites? And really use our local knowledge of what's happening on the ground in these subwatersheds to start to, to dive deeper into the data that we've collected. Because we're visiting these subwatersheds so frequently, we have really great info that kind of goes above and beyond precipitation and soil type differences. So we're able to start to piece together not only the phosphorus story, but the nitrogen story too. We have a lot of data at these sites. And overall, we have a pretty good handle of the general when we're getting losses, but not so much the why at the subwatershed level. So again, just thinking of Upper Medway, where, where I work at a, you know, that's 5,000 acres aggregated together. So in order to, to better understand what's going on, we have to pare it down even more. And then, so what we do is we, we start to work at the field scale. And that's um, also where the, like, what we're doing about it component comes into play. So I just said, you know, 450 swimming pools of water how do we even try to make a dent into trying to manage that in terms of water and nutrient and sediment losses? And that's really where that second piece, that second pillar of on-farm comes into play and the, the CA's involvement in, in research at the edge of the field site. Uh, the next slide just reiterates, um, again, where those fields, edge field sites are located. So the blue icons. So we're looking at things like different drainage types, cover crops, tillage, organic amendments, so there's a couple different projects that aim to test the effectiveness of different best management practices. And the next slide, I'm not gonna go into detail on set sampling setup, but just very similar to the subwatershed scale, we're monitoring year round, slightly different setup because we're trying to capture those driving events at both, the, both within tile drainage and overland flow at the edge of field sites in relation to a change in practice. So that's where I'm going to pass things over to Chris, who's going to review the data that's been collected and lessons learned from Maitland Valley's edge of field site. Okay, thanks, Tatiana. Uh, so I'm Chris Nesswick from Maitland Conservation. Yeah, and one of the really interesting things about on-farm was that we were monitoring at those different scales. So at the sub-watershed, it's one monitoring station in a creek, and it's capturing everything from 60 fields. At our edge of field site, it's one field and we're capturing uh, tile and overland 
uh, as well. So uh, at Edgefield site now we have we have six years of data because we were able to tack this on to the to the Glassy project. So that's two crop two full crop rotations. Uh, it's different soil moisture conditions, weather conditions, uh, tillage, as well as the timing of nutrients and different across that period. So when we zoom into the edge of field, it's easier in quotations, it's easier to tease out some of those land management practices. And that gives us that opportunity to see what's, what's working, uh, maybe where there's opportunities to reduce losses further. So we'll now look at the edge of field data. Uh, next slide. Oops. Okay, so on uh, this first graph that we're looking at, uh, this is uh, total phosphorus losses at our edge of field site, uh, the annual totals for the, the six years of data that we have. So those first three years were, were our, our glassy data set. Um, what I'll, I guess I'll talk a bit more about this one. So what's probably jumping out at you is that second year in the study, 2017-2018 uh, year. Um, it was noticeably higher than any of the other years in the study. Uh, if you turn on the the next, uh, just click it once there for me. Okay, so now the second graph is this, the losses over the same period, but at the watershed outlet. So what makes it interesting about the edge of field site is, okay, we had this year two really elevated losses, but it was a very average year at the watershed outlet where we're combining those 60 fields. So kind of ask the question, what happened? What happened at the watershed outlet? Well, it's a, combination of factors really. Uh, first off, it, it was a wet year. You know, Tatiana would have been talking about those big events and, and, and wet years uh, driving a lot of the losses. Well, it, it was a wet year uh, then. We had multiple runoff events. It was a miserable, miserable fall to get field work done. There was multiple runoff events and that continued through the winter. We had uh, multiple runoff events through the winter. Uh, there was one in February, kind of like what's teeing up right now. And I believe we had last year too, um, but we had other wet years in the study period too, and we didn't see you know losses to to the degree we did in, in year two. So the second factor uh, really comes down to land management. In that second year, so wheat was harvested and a cover crop was established, and then later in October, uh, liquid hog manure was was spread. A surface broadcast, and before they could get back to incorporate it, they got hit with a, a rainfall event. And since it was already wet that fall, we had a big tile flow event, huge losses. Um, as soon as they were able to get back on the field and incorporate it, they did early November. Uh, that chisel plow pass left the soil basically bare, and we got hit with another rainfall event, and then another, and it just continued through the winter. And uh, we, we ended up with that uh, year with elevated losses that, that we see. Uh, so it was those events that really drove the, the high losses in that year. Just to, for comparison's sake, if we look at uh, the fifth year in, the, in this study period, so I've got it indicated there with that yellow arrow. Uh, there we're back in the same part in the crop rotation. So this time uh, we, Wheat comes off, uh, cover crops established, but they tweak the timing of the manure application. So it's actually applied in August. Uh, it is not a wet year, tiles are not flowing and actually tiles don't even flow in this year until November. So it's uh, much, much drier fall, much drier south. You can see we, we don't see those, <laughs> we did not see the losses uh, that we did in, in year two. Uh, to compare another year, so if we look at the very last year of the study, um, it was similar, it was the most similar we had in terms of the amount of runoff and the timing of when that runoff occurred. So you can remember that that fall, I guess the, the fall of 2021, uh, another fall where there was a number of runoff events uh, through the fall and it continued through the winter. But the management aspect of this, in that non-growing season, uh, this farmer leaves the corn stalks untouched over the winter. They, they no-till soybeans into it in the spring. So 
100% residue cover essentially, uh, and no nutrient applications uh, going on in the fall. So different different years, uh, very very different results. If you look at one more, uh, the next slide, please, Tatiana. Uh, this is just another graph. So this is tile tile phosphorus concentrations again through that whole study period. And I've just put on these, these circles here, highlighting those two different times in this uh, six year period where uh, manure was applied, you know, after wheat. And uh, the first, first instance in the green circle, manure applied during a wet fall, unfortunate rain event right after, and then aggressive tillage. The next example, the yellow circle, manure on in August, no runoff happening yet and we get several months or two months before things really even start to flow we don't see those the peak in concentrations and we didn't see the the really high losses uh, so this is uh, an interesting example i guess of management coming into play and it's a piece of that story that we would not have really been able to to see if we were only monitoring at the, at the watershed scale or the sub watershed scale um, we all see when we get together and talk about this data share, we totally recognize there's a lot of trade-offs and, and tweaking these systems isn't easy. Uh, there's uh, some of the other sites involved in on-farm and certainly the modeling help us try to understand those trade-offs uh, even further. So at that point, I guess I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Colin at Upper Thames to share some of his uh, edge field results. Thanks, Chris. And uh, yeah, so it's Colin Little from the Lower Thames Valley Conservation Authority. So our BMP verification sites are located in Jeanette's Creek, which is in southwestern Ontario, kind of just southwest of Chatham, if you're looking at that upper right hand corner map. Um, so it's in one of the tributaries of the Thames River that's in the Flat Clay Plains um, of southwestern Ontario. So uh, the two fields we're looking at are Brooks and Clay soils, um, which is a unique characteristic for, for the study in terms of our area where you know these soils really have a tendency to crack, right? Which is an important factor to recognize, and I'll probably reference that later. Um, when they do crack, they do essentially provide preferential flow paths to tiles, right? So this is a very flat landscape. We don't have much much slope in these areas. Um, there's not a lot of overland flow. Pretty much all of the water is generally going through the systematic tile drainage systems. Um, so the two fields we're looking at, one is a no-till continuous cover crop system and a corn soy soybean rotation. Uh, the farmer plants cereal rye after soybeans, uh, plants green into that cereal rye, and he also has a multi-species cover crop after winter wheat when he has the time to get that establishment of all those different species. The second farmer uh, is more of a conservation tillage farmer, um, same rotation. He does use red clover, which he frost seeds in a winter wheat, but he terminates in the fall with tillage. So one thing to note here as well is these are tough, tough soils to stick to a rotation to plant. I mean, obviously they have very wet in the fall. In spring, we have wet years and it can be difficult to stick to the rotation of the VMPs you want to implement. So during the study period, um, there's times where both farmers deviated from the set plan. And uh, anyways, what I'm going to talk about today, though, is really the analysis we've started with Dr. Mary McRae from the University of uh, Waterloo. And, um, you know, this is all preliminary work she's working on publishing at this point. Uh, and I just also want to acknowledge that all these results are, are, you know, really have to do with the work that's going on from a number of people at the Lower Thames. Uh, Ryan Carlo on our team is the individual who really samples the sites and maintains the sites as well as other staff over the years. So just to, to let everyone else the team effort and, and by no means are these, uh, you know, all my results. So if we can turn to the next slide. So the first thing I wanna look at is the annual nutrient losses. So on the right hand side, if you're looking at that chart, the first section, you're essentially seeing each water year from 2017 to 2021, the flow at the top, and within each bar, the seasons are broken down. So. We have you know, the summer in red and that more kind of greeny teal color. We have the spring and the blue is the winter and the uh, bronze color is the fall. Um, also, you'll see that there's two bars in each water year. One is for the conservation tillage site on the left. One is for the no-till cover crop site on the right. So in terms of flow, what you're seeing is there's not 
really a ton of variance between the two systems is for tile drainage. Um, the majority of the flow is occurring during the non-growing season with some, some spring events, which are primarily occurring in April and May. We're not seeing a ton of activity in the summer at these sites, which is what we'd expect in terms of, you know, uh, water demand from crops, more ET, more heat, all those factors. Um, as you go down that chart, you start to see the DRP loads, the TP loads, the TSS loads, and nitrate loads. So uh, one thing we have found over the four years at the conservation tiller sites, conservation tiller sites, we're consistently seeing higher TSS, TP, and nitrate loads. Um, so that's an important factor. It's probably something we would expect with more tillage, um, less cover crops in the rotation. Uh, one other note there as well, which is important, is the TP and TSS sample concentrations have been significantly greater at the uh, conservation tillage site. So that is statistically significantly greater. And also one thing we're noticing about the no-till site, and this speaks to the trade-offs, is we are seeing higher DRP loads, so dissolved reactive phosphorus loads at the no-till site. And you'll notice I will circle the one year, that 2018-2019 year, if you look at the DRP loads there, you'll see there's a substantial increase in DRP loads at the no-till cover crop site, even though the TP loads are pretty close. So um, that's something I want to really focus on today. There's so many stories we can tell about this data, but we only have so much time. So I'm going to narrow in on that. Um, can we switch to the next slide? So one other thing we can look at here to kind of understand what's going at these sites and, and the phosphorus that we're losing is what types of phosphorus we're losing, right? So this chart is really showing the total phosphorus losses, um, essentially over each water year, but within the bars, we're actually breaking down the types. So, you know, that bronze color is particulate peas, so phosphorus that is bound in a particulate form. The red is the dissolved reactive phosphorus. That tealy color is dissolved re unreactive phosphorus, right? So. We can see at both sites, the TP loads are primarily in a particulate form. Uh, I think this comes back to the inherent soil conditions, those cracking clays. We get that preferential flow right to the tiles. There's not as much time for the water to percolate down to the soil matrix. Um, and it picks up a lot of those small, fine clay particles. So when you see the samples from our area, they often look, we always say it looks like chocolate milk, right? They're extremely turbid. There's a lot of sediment in there. Um, but the one interesting factor here is you know, we also see higher particulate loads from the conventionally or conservation tillage site, right? Where, where there is more tillage, you know, likely as a result of soil conditions, um, there's a lot more particulate that's getting into the tiles of that site relative to the no-till cover crop site. So that's interesting to see as well. It likely helps validate some of the, the good things we'd expect to see from a no-till uh, cover cropping system. But then it comes back to the trade-offs. So when we looked at that 2018, 2019 year at the no-till cover crop site, you see a huge increase in the portion of dissolved reactive phosphorus that was lost, right? So some of you may be able to suspect what happened there, but we'll get into the details in the next slide, if you can switch. So now, you know, as we're going to refine our scale, um, what this chart is showing you is essentially the cumulative event losses. So each time we got a flow event in this chart, we're looking at the cumulative load as it increases over time, or the cumulative flow, if it's that top chart, for all the different parameters we are monitoring. So you can see for, for things like TSS and, and total phosphorus, I mean, they kind of steadily increased over time with jumps periodically. Um, the dots are also of significance. So I should explain that as well. The dots essentially represent management practices at the field. So the blue, blue line is your kind of conservation tillage field. The pink is the cover crop field, no till cover crop field. And the dots on it, the black dot, essentially signifies the tillage practice, this one dot. Uh, when you see a blue dot, that signifies a fertility application, right? So if there's a black and blue dot, that means essentially the farmer applied surface broadcast the fertilizer, then he incorporated it with tillage. So that was the common practice at the conservation tillage site. Whereas at the no-till cover crop site, the farmer would surface broadcast this map, right? So you'll see I've circled one event um, in that DRP area where we saw the huge increase in dissolved reactive phosphorus. It was almost two kilograms per hectare in a series of three events in that water year where the DRP jumped significantly, right? And, and really what happened there was it was, it was a surface broadcast application of MAP pre-planting of winter wheat in the fall of October. Um, and 
rain events. It was a very wet year. We got a lot of rain events after that, a significant amount of flow. So that, that map was sitting on the surface. The winter wheat really hadn't emerged yet. And, you know, we essentially saw a ton of that, that map make its way down to the tiles and discharge, likely through, likely through preferential flow paths. Uh, where is that the more conservation tillage site where the farmer surface broadcasts that are incorporated with tillage? We didn't really see that same response, which is very interesting. So um, one thing we're learning is, is to mitigate losses of DRP, uh, incorporating phosphorus and getting phosphorus in the soil or map in the soil is, is really effective at, at mitigating losses of DRP. Uh, the trade-off here though is that over time, you know, it's kind of hurting in every other category, right? So we're still seeing higher TP losses from the conservation tillage site or conventional tillage site where there's a lot more tillage. Um, we're seeing much higher TSS loads, right? We're talking about barely significant total suspended sediment loads from these sites, higher nitrate loads. Um, so yes, maybe it's doing a good job at mitigating the loss of DRP after fertilizer applications to, to incorporate it with tillage, but in the long run, it's probably gonna lead to higher TP loads, higher TSS loads, higher nitrate loads. And, and over time, we'll see what it means for DRP as well. So the next slide, please. So lessons learned, I mean, when I look at the results we've collected the data as we start to analyze this information and some of the, the interesting trends we've been able to pull out, I think there's just a ton of opportunity here to improve both systems. So, um, you know, for the no-till cover crop site, I think by incorporating some four hour principles and practices, by trying to move those, those surface broadcast applications out of windows when, you know, we know there's gonna be runoff, right? If there's a way to do that, uh, we likely mitigate our, our potential for losing DRP significantly. Um, also, finding a way to get map in the soil uh, could make a big difference as well. I mean, if there's a feasible way to ban fertilizer in that system, um, that could also help mitigate those losses and really, really improve the no-till cover crop system in these soils. Um, the conservation tillage system, I think same thing for our practices. Both these farmers tend to be apply, applying their bulk applications of map and potash in the fall. There's a way to, to try and move that needle a bit that can help um, reducing the tillage, making it not as frequent. Um, and also if we can get a cover crop in during the non-growing season at that site, it would likely help. Just something to hold the soil in place as we enter that, that time period when flow occurs. Um, something else we've learned and similar to the other CAs, as they mentioned, a few events can have a significant impact on the load over time. Uh, so, you know, that one surface, broad app, surface broadcast app, application at the no-till cover crop site that, that essentially was 40% of the load of those four years, the DRP load. So that's, you know, a few events really can make a huge difference in the long run. Um, however, different management practices can significantly mitigate those losses, right? We do have tools to, to reduce the risk of losing that, that phosphorus. We've kind of seen that in the four years of data we're looking at. Um, I'd also just point out that the inherent soil conditions can lead to much higher loads regardless of the BMPs you're implementing, right? So both these farmers are, are implementing BMPs, but relative to other other field losses, you know, we're talking about, they're both kind of in the range of 1.8 to 2.5 kilograms per hectare annually of total phosphorus losses. I mean, those are significantly high losses relative to other fields um, in Ontario. Uh, and I think a lot of it comes down to the soils they're farming with these bricks and clays, right? So, um, you know, there's going to be some areas that are just going to have higher loads. It's, it's just the reality of scenario based on the inherent conditions. Uh, I'd also just add that, you know, we're really just scratching the surface of what we started here. I mean, I've, there's so much information in the results and we can only share so much today, but we really need to continue to work with these farmers to keep identifying and validating feasible solutions to reduce nutrient loads. Um, but, you know, it has to work at the farm scale. It has to work from a production perspective. It can't just work from an environmental perspective if we want to get widespread adoption of these BMPs. Um, and then, yeah, the only other note here really is these are preliminary results. There are limitations. Uh, we need to incorporate a lot more of our surface water runoff data at this point, uh, which is which is still pretty pretty much in its infancy. So there's lots of work still to do. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll pass things off to Tatiana. Excellent. Uh... Thank you, Colin and Chris and Tatiana. I'm actually going to just uh, take over the microphone here for a second to introduce our next speaker. And uh, we'll come back to 
a couple of you in our panel speaker after Dr. Yang uh, shares his information on modeling. So I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Wen Hong Yang. He is a professor of, in the Department of Geography, Environment and Geomatics at the University of Guelph. And Dr. Yang will provide an overview of the watershed BMP modeling for on-farm. And you have about 10 minutes for your presentation, Dr. Yang. And the microphone is over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Bowen. It's our great privilege able to join the on-farm project. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the team and uh, Dr. Bidrigo Renda, postal, and Laura Hopkins is a guest researcher, and Jubro Bello and the COP students. Yeah, they work so hard and to produce uh, modern results. We're still working hard on it. Uh, so I also want to take this opportunity to thank Mountain and Valley Conservation Authority, allow uh, Laura Hopkins, our previous research associate, and we need to work once. Uh, one day a week, actually, is, uh, in our group and uh, to um, uh, for the modeling. Thank you. So uh, next slide, please. I learned so much about you know in on in an on farm project or previous project. It's about like a, also a very prominent uh, topic about this project and or previous project is about partnership. So here that's and we do have this model and it's produced in our group and we develop this model and we get into location. And then it's not say I want to get drilled down details about the model inputs and outputs. I just want to say that and for the modeling itself, it's really exemplified the partnership. We need to get it data from everybody. And I always say, okay, I'm data hungry. And I always appreciate and how conservation authority clicks and they put so much time into like monitoring and, and all this effort put in and lots of hard work. And also that's and also want to thank the uh, farmers and then I know conservation authority colleagues interviewed them to provide, you know, land management data about planning, harvesting, all the information. It's very important because we only need we need to know the more accurate management information so that we know how management change is going to make a difference. So that's pretty much uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank all of them for that. So the modeling is a water model. So we are going to simulate from water and then go, you know, sediment and nutrient and uh, phosphorus. So that's pretty much the idea that from a location to field and a farm. And also the mode is simulated by, by day. And we simulate by day and then we have a, a period and then we simulate summarize results into any results. Yeah, next slide, please. So this is just in a nutshell how mode works. And uh, as I said, you know, we need lots of data and then we use this data to build the model. And then using a lot of monitoring data and to calibrate the model, make sure it is representing the historical and existing condition. So that's pretty much how model build. But um, after building the model, and then looks like we'll build a laboratory, we we'll start experiments, say, okay, we already have BMPs. What are the effectiveness? So that's the question we should answer. So how do we do that? We're going to remove those BMPs from the model. And then we simulate the model again, compare with existing condition, historical, and then we see what the difference are. For example, like I say, for tillage, and we're going to say, okay, if you have any conservation tillage or no till, and then we're going to say, okay, I'm going to remove them and they'll become conventional. And then same with cover crop and the same with further incorporation, like this practice. Another benefit of the model is that we're able to add the BMPs to the model. Say we want 100% no till. And we'll have everybody incorporate fertilizer. You know, every field, every crop, we do like a like a like a like a cover crop, and and for that. So that's pretty much how the model and able to experiment and uh, to see what the result looks like. So we do have some preliminary results to show, and we still work on it. And next slide, please. Yeah, it's about like we use up as an example. So we. What we are trying to show that, and they, I want to give you a little bit like a context about this map, is that, and like I said, we calibrate the model at Western Outlet and at monitoring location. So right now, what I'm showing you here is that it's on-site effectiveness. What that means? It means how much like a benefit we achieve at location and you know, get into the water cost. And then of course, they're going to have a transport to the outlet and for doing that. So this is important is because, and we, for example, for farmers who want to know, you know, I did all the work and what a benefit I can achieve right at the edge of my field like that. So in this cases, and then what we showed here looks number, you're gonna say, oh, it's so small, what's that about? 
you know, because this is the difference between that I did a conservation tillage or didn't, like a, like a, like a conservation tillage or versus no, no tillage is the difference. So the difference is that, but if they say, okay, I did not do conservation tillage, my like a loss of sediment is 0 0.5 tons per hectare per year. So now then, then here the number it shows that you know they may reduce and uh, you know 0 0.02 or 0 0.002 or something like that number. So then with the reduction of that. So from this map, what we are trying to show is that or we do a few things. First is the magnitude. You know what kind of magnitude, and we can see that about those reductions. Second thing that what's the spatial distribution? Some of the places, and then they achieve more, some achieve less. Of course, there's going to have lots of reasons behind it, and it's not a time to get into details. So that's pretty much the first one, and then we say that okay, we remove it. Okay, next slide, please. Is that we want to show that if we, you know, add a fish at the end piece to that, you're going to say, well, it looks like there's not too much room for that. Yeah, it could be because the you know, farmers already practice a lot of conservation tillage and, and for doing that, we're going to additionally to do more work. And then if we do that, and what kind of sediment and the reduction could be, looks like further reduction, I mean, the further reduction about, about uh, from the based on the baseline scenario. So that's uh, about the, uh, the tillage. So now, next slide, please. And then interesting about that, and I'd like to show a little about uh, fertilizer incorporation uh, scenario. So I noticed the kids and the experts, the fertilizer experts talk about you know, genetic quick and they incorporate like a banding. And then we did a simulating scenario about the fertilizer menu incorporation in fact place. So in this cases, and basically we show that if, if, and the, as I said, a mode can experiment, and then we remove all the incorporation and everything steps up, uh, applied. Of course, that's not realistic. But again, mode are just trying to say that you know, if we do that, and now we already have people incorporate, what kind of like TP leaving the field reduction looks like? You can see that some of the, you know, the red one means that, oh, it's quite some benefit, right? And the relatively, and of the green one is a little bit more less, and maybe they are not too much difference, They're already self-applied like that. So that's pretty much, again, is about magnitude, about magnitude and what we can get, and then, and also about spatial distribution. So next slide, please. Yeah, so this one, and <laughs> it's interesting is that, okay, regardless what the condition looks like right now, we just apply, say, okay, 100% incorporation. It doesn't matter what time of further application, we all incorporate what type of pattern looks like. Again, I'm just trying to say that this type of exercises Pretty much is expanding our thinking. If we do A, and it looks like we do B, what looks like, and then we like half of people do that, what looks like 30%, you know, 70% what looks like. So this is kind of like more experiments help us to uh, think him further what next step uh, uh, looks like. Okay, next slide, please. So, you know, in terms of modern work, as I said, I have to say it's very privileged. And for me, it involved with the WBBE actually from 2014 and the Western Best Management Practice Program. They don't want to get in the glass seat and now the on farm. And it's a great experience. I always want to say that how can we continue and strengthen the partnership on BMP programs? And then I, I'm willing to be, and I'm also very thrilled to be part of the process. So that's uh, the first thing I would like to say. And the second one I want to say, I'm always a promoter of a Catalonian authority critics uh, for collecting data. So I always want to say that I remember in 2014 when we started to do data and the clinic and uh, Kevin McCagg and other people who worked together, you know, they just started to do those data collections. They have some efforts, but now you see that after the dollar BBE and then and uh, the um, glass deal and then now, and we see the more time series data. I always want to say that if data is lost, you cannot go back. And then it's have no gap. So I always want to say if resource limited, please go to monitoring and put modeling afterwards. So that's pretty much I always promote for that. And then the third one, I want to say that how can we communicate results to a wide audience and let people know a BMP actually in the long run and do have tangible benefits and for that. And then the last point is that 
you know, we already did lots of very detailed work. This work will continue. Can we, you know, transfer to other locations and get a more representative landscape and across the province? And also, can we scale up a little bit? Like say, you know, we have a right now about 20 square kilometers. Can we go to be large one to see how the, the results and the monitoring collaboration, and then we use the model to scale up and to see what it in fact looks like. So that's pretty much uh, my message. I want to thank all of you again and for listening to me. And uh, the other side is great opportunity for us to share results and also appreciate all the partnership. Thank you. Bye, and back to you. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Yang. That was very interesting to learn more about the modeling aspect of the on-farm project. So appreciate that. And you're going to stay with us as part of a panel. And we're Thank going to you. bring back Tatiana. And we're also going to bring two uh, new speakers onto our uh, water quality indicators panel. So we have, we're going to be joined by James Kober, who's a programs analyst with OSCIA, and Rick Kutstra, who's an on-farm cooperator, and he farms with his brother south of Clinton, and also volunteers with the Huron View Demonstration Farm. So welcome everyone to the panel. We've got Tatiana and Dr. Yang here, and there's James, and hopefully Rick is appearing soon as well. Great. Um, excellent. Is Rick joining us, Andrea? Have, am I missing him on my... Oh, there you are. Perfect. Hi, Rick. Now I can see you. Uh, we're going to start with you, actually, to open our discussion. And can you share an overview of the BMP studied at the Huron View demonstration farm? And how have the trials at Huron View influenced your management practices in your own farm operation? And just a reminder, we have about three minutes for this overview. So. Okay, three minutes. That's pretty... <laughs> Pretty intense. Okay, so <laughs> what do I do at Here in View? Um, I've, I've brought my own skill set from home uh, and any abilities or any machinery or anything that I could to uh, to repair and, and fix that place to what it is today. Um, there's about 150 ton of riprap and, and field stone that we use to stop and make water beds. So that we slow the water down or stop it. There's uh, there was two foot gullies through the farm from runoff and, and erosion. Uh, the place has been tiled. We put grass waterways in. We farm under a uh, strict system of low compaction, strip tillage, no till, cover crop, um, just as described in the previous three or four or five speakers. We are data collectors. We are monitoring the water um, for uh, runoff of nitrate, phosphorus, and potash, and other elements. Um, I've been there for five years, and uh, will continue to, to uh, uh, stay there. Uh, we, learn, uh, we learn from each other. We bring speakers in. We uh, walk the place and, and uh, again, learn from each other. Uh, it's a privilege to do all this. And, uh, and also, before you, before I end here, I, I should like to thank uh, Kelly. She was your first speaker from the, the minister, from the, from the, uh, what is she, the deputy? Assistant and, deputy minister, yep, ADM. And so, so thank you very much for those uh, kind remarks about hearing you. And, Excellent. uh, and I'm here to take any questions. So, excellent. Thanks, Rick. Thanks for getting us started here, and good to hear a little bit more about here on view. Uh, so, uh, Tatiana, I'm going to turn to you. So, in addition to testing water quality directly, what indicators could producers look at to understand their wall water quality? Yeah, it's it's really hard to know what's going on in the water without measuring it. Um, like anytime water is leaving your field, nutrients are leaving with it, but it's really hard to put a put a number behind that, um, especially that dissolved fraction uh, of your, your nutrients, you can't see it. Um, when you get into the situations where you're, you're getting sediment leaving your field, you can sure bet that there are nutrients tied to that sediment. And one of the things that we actually, we didn't get to, to chat about, but uh, at, actually at Huron View, where they had applied 116 pounds of MAP, and that was followed by a two and a half inch rain uh 
I don't know if it was Rick or, or another a person who works at here on view, but they noticed that there were soap suds coming out of the tile. So that's a really good indicator that, that, that something's going on, that you have high phosphate levels. So working with the Sable Bayfield, they were able to, to sample that. And um, they, they came up with a, a bit of a calculation that they only lost a half a percent of the map that was applied, but it translated into a, a pound of phosphorus from, from the field. So they, they lost their, what was equivalent to the previous year's whole nutrient load, whole phosphorus load in, in, that, in that one event. Yeah, that's quite the event then. So uh, thank you for that. And Rick, would you like to add anything to what Tatiana mentioned about what farmers could look for in terms of indicators? Uh, yes, the, the higher the soil organic matter, the, the better. Okay, so we, we could probably get soils. I farm soils that, that are at, uh, some of them are at 6%. But as you whittle that down with degradation, you're subjecting yourself to everything. And so that's what we're learning and relearning at uh, our, our own farms as well as at Hearing View. So what Tatiana says about uh, runoff and into the tile and with, uh, with the uh, phosphorus, yeah, uh, it's, that's true. Uh, the, Im the impact or the implications, I'm not sure were uh, are as bad as, uh, as it was trumped up. But uh, we did take on a, a three and a half inches of rain in a couple of days. So, you know, expectations are, are pretty low at saving everything. But uh, so we lost some, some, we lost some fertilizer into the, into the water, I believe. Uh, soil did not move. Uh, so if, if I looked at the application, if it had been done, while the, the crop was still in place. So we, we fertilized after the crop was harvested. If we'd have been able to get in there over the crop with all that residue, it's doubtful we would have had that runoff. So, you know, that's a what maybe a mini BMP we could look at down the road is, is, is always, if you're going to broadcast, always try and broadcast into a cover. Um, previous speaker mentioned uh, a little bit of tillage to to work that kind of thing in, okay, you can, and that's that's beneficial, uh, but you're creating other problems down the road uh, with degradation and and soil tillage is 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 a, is a is a bad deal for us. So, uh, again, another maybe mini best management practice there is to really watch how we're going to apply fertilizer in the future, whether that's uh, if you broadcast it, I think into a cover is nice. And if you're using a, 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 a tillage tool, it would be nice to, to uh, uh, incorporate it with the same tool. So like a, a strip till machine. Oh, great. Yeah, I like the mini BMP idea. And that kind of gets at a question in the chat about are there additional BMPs required uh, in to manage some of these major events uh, in the field level. So thank you for that. Tatiana, did you want to jump in there? Or? Yeah, I was just going to add that this comes back to what Colin and what Chris were saying in terms of in terms of trade offs. Um, and like if we're how do we manage do field management outside of these these large events? And we understand that, you know, sometimes they come out of nowhere and these things happen. But how do we long term plan for not necessarily having management and large events line up. Yeah, great. Yeah, it does seem very complex with the trade-offs in mind of what so the pros and cons of all these uh, factors. Uh, I want to turn back to Wan Hung. Um, we know farmers can select from a range of BMPs to protect water quality and improve soil health. Could you please provide an example or two of how modeling indicators can help farmers to select the best BMPs for their particular situation, their region, their soils? Uh, if you could just share a bit about that, that'd be great. Yep. Thank you, Bob. So, yeah. In some way, I was thinking about how modeling can contribute and the farmer operations. I always highly respect the actions on landscape stewards. So I would say from two standing points. One is from spatial dimension. For example, on today's map, we show that and the going to be BMP effectiveness is field specific. And then they know the farm best. 
and the result can help them say, well, you know, why this one is more effective, this is less effective in some way that, and so that they may contribute to some spatial management about BMP implementation. Second thing is that, and, and the model can help to simulating one, two, or combined, we combine all together, just like, and I also talk about a trade-off. Sometimes this one works, this one not working. So all this type of BMP combination and those trade-offs can also help farmers to decide what's the best action to do that. And in terms of the like um, BMPs, we all know that the no silver bullets is going to be very challenging. And especially look at long run efforts about that is how to spatially you know, like, like managing BMPs and also that different combination of BMPs. And, and then also today's so I also talk about positions or everything. The model can also provide more information about, you know, up position, no position, and then actually you can see the differences. Yeah, thank you. I pause here. Great, thank you. And James, I want to bring you into the conversation. Uh, do you have anything to add about how farmers might be able to best select select the best BMPs for their region and soils? Sure, I think maybe less regionally, but following Wan Hung's work and seeing it come together, I think that we might have a tendency to walk away from this, treating these BMPs as one or the other, like, are you cover cropping or are you, like, what's your tillage strategy? And there's, there's always like a gradient within that. And so we can, we can talk about no tilling, but I think there's a lot of value in moving from, say, a conventional till to a, a reduced till in some way as well, that we want to Keep people in mind that there's there's a lot of options you can choose within this this wider range, and they're all going to have some benefits that you need to balance with your own agronomics. And the other thing, looking at the chat and seeing obviously Jen Dolman's situation uh, up north with manure is um, think about your planning ahead of time. And if you you really plan for a BMP to take effect over the winter, and say you're you're interseeding a cover crop into your corn, uh, and it doesn't and it doesn't take, you don't have a good catch. Think about other ways that you can get that residue. Kind of coverage over the winter, whether it's reseeding something, uh, which a few of our on-farm cooperators did in December or even January or March uh, to mixed effect. And you can check that out on the cover crop dashboard. Um, or whether that's reducing the amount of uh, corn that you break up, maybe you take a tillage pass out, maybe you leave a little bit more residue cover to make up for that. And you, you make those contingency plans when you're thinking about your BMPs. Excellent. Thank you. I'm going to uh, close off this panel with one question for all of you. And uh, if a producer is looking to improve water quality on their farm, how would you suggest they start? And just one sentence or a quick snapshot, kind of like we heard earlier today for the, uh, the soil health indicators. So one sentence or two, if a producer is looking to improve water quality on their farm, how would you suggest they get started? And Tatiana, do you want to take that first? Sure. Um... I guess we'll tie, tie it back to that soil health piece. So building soil organic matter. So you're gonna increase your water holding capacity, but also um, gonna reduce, reduce erosion off of your fields. Great, thank you. Good sentence. And uh, Wan Hung. Thank you. And I, I think one of the things is that for other modeler, and I'm hoping modern results can provide to them. And then the farmers, when they do the actions, maybe they can look at this against those kind of results to see that it makes sense or not. And then in that way, and they can be more like a more big picture type of management and in terms of how to balance their own and like productivity. And then in the meantime, balance those water quality impacts. Yeah, thank you. Excellent, thank you. And Rick? So uh, question is, uh, how do we improve water quality? So one-year plan, five-year plan, whatever plan you have, first thing I would do is uh, look for where the water's coming onto the farm and, and leaving. If you can slow it down, that's a benefit. So you're slowing erosion. Mm -hmm. If you're, Hopefully your farm's tiled, so you can control the flow and slow that. I'd plant a cover crop, uh, a multi-species, and, uh, and, and take it year by year, uh, bearing in mind some of the soil health principles. And I'd stick with a cover crop, uh, no-till, strip-till program on the three crops if I could. Excellent. Thank you, Rick. That's great advice. And James, final comment to you. Yeah. Uh, Omafra has a great program online called AgriSuite. It's available for free. I would encourage people to check out the phosphorus loss assessment tool, Plato. Uh, if you're not fortunate enough to have a conservation authority and an academic modeler working with you directly on your farm, you can punch in some of your own numbers and see what management practices or some changes would do to your own phosphorus potential uh, leaving the fields there. 
Excellent. A little plug for the Agar Suite. Maybe somebody from OMAFRA on the line can put a link to the to that tool in the uh, chat. That would be really helpful. So I'll look for somebody to pop that in. Um, but great. Thank you to all four of you for joining us for this Water Quality Indicators panel. I really appreciate your time and your insights. So uh, thanks again for joining us today. And with that, we'll turn to our final panel of this on-farm forum, and we're going to be diving into the agronomic benefits and co-benefits of BMPs. And I'm going to introduce our panelists. We have Larry Dick joining us, who's a cash crop farmer in Campton and also an on-farm cooperator. Gord Green runs a dairy and cash crop operation with his family north of Embro. Gord is also an on-farm cooperator. See a theme here, I think. And uh, Dr. Karen Thompson is an associate professor at Trent University and the coordinator of the Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems Program. And we are also rejoined by Colin Little and Dr. Angela Stratoff. So welcome, everybody. And we're just going to get started with Angie. Uh, if you could get us started, can you please explain what is meant by the terms agronomic benefits and co-benefits of BMPs? Sure, I think it's an important distinction, um, but maybe a distinction that's getting blurrier every day uh, as we learn about how co-benefits uh, might also have agronomic benefits. But really agronomic benefits are, are referring to something you can measure from the cash crop itself. So we're talking about indicators like yield or productivity, uh, forage or grain quality, moisture, um, disease resistance, like all those things you can you can measure from uh, what what you're growing and, and what you're marketing ultimately. Uh, and then the co-benefits, we think more of things like like less tangible, maybe less measurable, but go alongside uh, supporting increases in those agronomic indicators. So um, you can think of things like like enhancing water quality, so the sort of downstream or offsite benefits. Um, sequestering carbon, enhancing your soil health, again, like a little less measurable, but important for, for enhancing agronomic output. Great, thanks, Angie. And Karen, would you like to add anything for context there? Um, sure, yeah. So I guess when I think of benefits versus co-benefits, I would kind of classify the co-benefits as being maybe unanticipated or unplanned benefits um, that are kind of helping another sustainability outcome. So I think although when we think about, you know, BMP adoption, traditionally maybe we've had kind of more reliance on like the enthusiasm and ability to adopt these BMPs being rooted in scientific evidence and sharing that knowledge about the actual, um, about how that we can attain those co-benefits but still not decrease our agronomic benefits in field. Um, but there's an interesting opportunity now because we're seeing that there's more interest in, um, valuing those co-benefits as well. So it's an interesting opportunity, I think, going forward. Excellent. Thank you, Karen. And I want to bring the uh, on-farm cooperators into here. Um, so if, whoops, yeah, excuse me, <laughs> what BMPs are you using and what are the benefits you are seeing on your farm? And Gord, if we can get started with, with you. Um, so on our farm, uh, we've been no-till or strip-till since about 1995. We've been uh, using cover crops on corn silage and wheat ground uh, since la over the last 12 years. And on wheat, it's been for a lot longer than that. Um, and then we use organic amendments. Uh, uh, we have an anaerobic digester on our farm. So um, we're using digestate as opposed to manure on a lot of our acres. Well, on all of them, actually. And uh, uh, I think they all kind of come together to, to give us some benefits. Uh, so we're seeing reduced compaction, a lot better weed control. Uh, we're seeing uh, benefits to the, uh, uh, from the cover crops to the, to the next crop of mycorrhizae uh, for corn. Uh, we get, um, uh, and I think there's things that we haven't got a good handle on, such as maybe a reduction in greenhouse gases uh, and erosion reduction. Uh, there's a whole suite of benefits. Great. Thank you. And uh, Larry, over to you. Uh, what we're looking at is I want cover crops to be doing my tillage pro or what we used to do with tillage programs. So we're, we aim at full no-till. Uh, I want to keep a living root in the soil for as much of the year as we possibly can. 
so that's using multi-species cover crops behind wheat and buckwheat or interseeding covers into corn and sunflowers and then hopefully behind no-till or behind soybeans we're no-tilling wheat so uh, we haven't got all the acres covered with a living root but we've got the vast majority of them so that's an ongoing goal uh, we're rotating crops aggressively trying not to repeat a crop and we're planting green so we're terminating covers after planting in an effort to keep things growing so Benefits, I still have a tough soil, that doesn't change, but we are seeing the soil stabilize, a uh, lot of earthworms indicating more biology. No tilling means we're not, we have no tillage erosion anymore and we're still able to grow a good crop. Um, so it, it's still a learning process, but we're getting there. Great, thank you, Larry. And Colin, uh, drawing on your experience in the Jeanette's Creek study subwatershed, can you please provide an example or two of how the implementation of agronomic BMPs can help to address multiple watershed environmental challenges? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, I mean, uh, in a watershed like the Thames River, you know, we have about 80% agricultural land use. So, um, you know, when we look at a lot of our environmental challenges in the watershed, I really see, you know, so I hope BMPs is being a, a real driving factor to how we can address many of these challenges. So you know, if I was to talk to our species at risk biologist in her office, she would get really excited to hear, you know, that the acres of cover crops are going up or that no-till is going up in terms of implementation rates because it's going to have downstream benefits in terms of reducing total suspended sediment loads, right? So we, from some of the results we saw from Shedd's Creek that the TSS loads were, you know, a metric ton per year <laughs> from per actor, right? So um, if we could cut that in half through implementing these BMPs, that can do a lot for aquatic species at risk in the Thames River watershed. So, you know, there's all these factors, as mentioned earlier, carbon sequestration for climate change is obviously huge, um, you know, pollinator benefits, uh, native insects, all these types of things that can benefit from these types of, you know, best management practices are, are huge. Um, and also just the resiliency it introduces into a, an agronomic system, right? I think that's another big thing I hear from a lot of farmers like this past year, we had drought like conditions um, in Chatham County area and a lot of Southwestern Ontario, a lot of the ones that have been implementing strip tillage or organic amendments or, you know, um, cover crops for years, think they maintained really good yields this year, even though we had way less water, um, you know, as a result of, of the practices they've implemented and having that more water pulling capacity in those systems and soils. So, yeah, I think there's there's a lot of a lot of co-benefits associated with these things. And um, sometimes, you know, we're always thinking about phosphorus, right? But um, yeah, it's it's definitely beyond that uh, when we talk about these BMPs. Um, it can it can affect a lot of different things in the watershed. So. Great. Thank you. Uh, so I have a question from the chat. So uh, Ruth Knight is asking, what soil monitoring activities are the farmers using? So Larry and Gord, this one's for you. So soil monitoring activities are you using on your farms and what has surprised you? Uh, one thing that shocked me this spring, uh, we, we had we had an, an okay planting season right near the end of it. We had a major rain and that was the last rain for a number of weeks. But um, I was up against a time crunch, namely a, a commitment to going away with a family for the weekend, and we had a bunch of planting to do. And we had a two inch rainfall over three days, and I figured I'm out for a week. And we were able to plant the next day on a heavy stand of ryegrass. We planted soybeans, and it shocked me. They planted well, it was still wet, but it wasn't muddy. And, and it was a fantastic field of beans. That absolutely blew me away. Um, having said that, we had some other lessons that we learned that weren't as positive this year, so. <laughs> Take the good with the bad, right? <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> oh, thanks. That's interesting, Larry. And Gord, do you have anything on, you'd like to add to that? Well, we routinely soil test every three years. It's a conventional soil test, main nutrients and organic matter. Uh, but going along with what Larry said, uh, Sometimes you see visual differences and ex over time. So the ability to plant fields when they're less than ideal under conventional tillage, you'd end up with virtually no crop under a no-till situation, the, the soil's in better shape and you don't get the smearing and uh, of the seed trench and, and you end up with uh, 
uh, getting a good crop. So, and in rain events like we're having today, if the ground, if we didn't have the snow cover we got right now, I'd be able to see my fields would be absorbing water, whereas the neighbors that are under conventional tillage would have it running across. So once in a while, you get the visuals that uh, tell you something as well. well that's good. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I have another question. I'm not sure who this one might be addressed to, but I might uh, turn to Karen or uh, Angie first. But do, is there any data on leveling the fields where possible, if that improves the reduction of runoff and soil health in the long run? Anyone want to comment on that? the aspect of leveling fields? I do not know about this, but this has just put a potential thing we could do here at our farms. We just put tile in last year and it's a mess. So we need to level it a bit. So maybe this is a new project for us at the <laughs> Trent Farm. <laughs> Perfect, there you go. Angie, do you want to comment on that or anyone else want to jump in? Uh, yeah, I guess the idea is like reducing the slope to to reduce water erosion. Colin might uh, jump in and know more about that and and if it's been done in his region. Yeah, it is. It is a fairly you know common practice in the clay plain areas. Like if they get a bit of rutting or tile lateral set, and you get a depression in the soil, often you'll see some tillage followed by land leveling. Um, yeah, I mean, I I gotta imagine it's. I'm sure it's for more agronomic reasons than anything else. I'm not too sure how it would affect water quality of the environment. I'd have to think it's somewhat similar to tillage because it's usually following tillage. Um, but yeah, I can't really say anything definitively around that. All right. So maybe an area to look into a little bit more in the future. So thank you for that question. And then I have another one uh, here. How do you convince those farmers who are resistant to adopting beneficial approaches, for example, planting cover crops to improve, improve soil health and mitigate erosion? So what are some of those uh, social, maybe <laughs> persuasion tricks? Uh, so I don't know who I'll open that up to. Larry, do you wanna take a first stab at that? I keep thinking of a comment that uh, Dr. Lee Brees, uh, an agronomist from North Dakota made uh, two years ago at our soil network cohort and he said in his experience it takes seven years from the time he drops an idea on a farmer's lap to the time the farmer has fully adopted it there's a lot at play you know you have to get past people's reservations um dr Dwayne beck said until somebody has their first soil heart attack they don't change their eating habits so that too like it takes time so how do we convince them um, by showing that we can grow crops, good crops doing it. Great. So that success from uh, actually doing the, getting a successful crop there will inspire others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. And Gord, do you want to add anything? Um, I think a lot of times we, we're, we're looking at a particular issue and, and this program, this on-farm program was uh, created to address the Fosters and Lake Erie uh, as as one of its main goals, uh, the thing is about a lot of these practices, they do a lot more than that. They they're they're improving a whole lot of factors that. So it isn't just one thing that we're improving. We're 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 reducing compaction. We're uh, do better weed control. We're uh, uh, re possibly reducing greenhouse gases. Um, there's just a, a whole lot of benefits that. So you got to add them up. It isn't just one thing. Uh, one thing I failed to mention, I feed my cover crops to livestock, so I'm double cropping in a way, and there's a lot of economic value to that, I feel anyway, so mm -hmm. um, that's another aspect. So it's a cumulative effect of a bunch of different benefits. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Uh, I have a question here I'd like to get at is... Um, how many years of... Re we heard this morning uh, from Anne, I believe, saying it might take 10 years to see changes in the soil health and things like that. So I'm just curious, how many years of research do we need to conduct to get a clear picture of the benefits and co-benefits of BMPs? Larry's laughing a little bit, but I'll start with Karen. Do you want to comment first? And then I'll go to you, Larry. I mean, where Anne started with is a good starting point of maybe five to 10 years at minimum. I think we're going to need more and more seasons of data collected as we have like more variability in our climate. Um, so it's a tough question to answer if we don't know, I guess, what we're actually measuring within this question. Um, but yeah, longer than, than what works with current funding schemes and student uh, timelines in academic research. So the on-farm program, if we can keep it going, will be awesome. 
<laughs> Good plug to keep that going. Yeah, so the long-term field trials are critical. Uh, Larry, you look like you wanted to add something here. You know, our, we've got long-term rotation tillage trial plots at Ridgetown and Alora. They're going on 40 years. The Morrow plots at Urbana in the University of Illinois are 150 years. That's long term. Um, and, and and yet, you know, even looking at our own 40 year rotation trials, they show benefits of rotation and yet lots of farmers don't rotate. So <laughs> it, it, how many years? It's a long game. Um, on farm has been great. And, and yeah, it, it, we need more. Great. Thank you. Does anyone else want to add to that, Gord? I was going to say, like, as, as far as uh, maybe lab analysis, it's hard to see the benefit in the short term. But uh, if you grow a, a, a forage and you take a soil sample, just looking at the aggregation of those particles, uh, you can see right away that there's a definite benefit over that over a corn ground or a soybean ground. So, and I think you would see the same sort of physical improvement in the soil texture with cover crops. So I think visually there is an, a, an, a benefit almost right away, like within the first year. So uh, yeah, we're struggling with the lab part of it, but uh, visually I can see it. Great. Oh, well, that's a great perspective. Uh, does anyone want to add to that piece? Yeah. I think I'd echo some of what was already said. I do think it's, you know, a decades kind of thing. Right. But I do think it's important to recognize you're going to, probably identify benefits along the way, right? So it's not like, you know, things things are gonna come up in the data over time, right? So that being said, that continuous monitoring piece to, to understand what's going on as things change or when you're doing environmental monitoring and you're really at the mercy of nature to get the conditions you may want um, to understand how certain systems are working, uh, you really need those longer term um, studies to, to really understand what's going on, so yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you. And uh, I guess I'll start, maybe we might go back to you, Gord, but uh, what are the uh, gaps in research? Like, what are some things that you'd like to see answered uh, that researchers on the call today might go off? Oh, Karen's there, she might <laughs> take that back to her <laughs> lab, but uh, where are some of those gaps in BMPs and co-benefits that you're seeing? Well, I, it's already been uh, referred to as uh, we need this uh, project like this to go on longer to, to, to uh, documents the benefits over the long term. Uh, but one other uh, it concerns no-till and residue management. And, uh, you know, some people feel that they need to chop stocks and residue down and have it a mat on the ground. Other ones feel that we have to incorporate it. I've heard other people like earthworms feed off the surface. They don't feed off residue in the ground. Um, so it kind of a residue management and how best to optimize soil health by the way we handle the residue so all right residue management that sounds like a good new research project for somebody uh larry do you want to add anything to that yeah as i guess one of my questions ongoing is how do nutrient needs change as we incorporate more and more covers hmm. uh there's lots of somewhat anecdotal but even more than that of of having covers growing leaving them there impacts uh, fertilizer availability because of microbiome and, and root exudates and all that stuff. Like it's just a huge field that we know very little about. And so how does that impact me as I pull into the field to plant? Uh, right. Those are judgment calls that I as a farmer need to have, would like to have more answers to. Great. Thank you. Uh, Karen, you've heard a couple good ideas there for New research, do you want to comment on how that might dovetail with academic research that is ongoing or where that might fit in? Uh, yeah, I think like there's a lot of work going on looking at both benefits and co-benefits of different BMP adoption. But, you know, from a research perspective, we're really constrained to small scale approaches and, you know, plot size trials. So having um, access to producers who want to do long term, like the side by side field comparison is really important. Um, and I, I did mention like we're limited by funding um, often, but if we have like a network like this set up, then we can also hopefully integrate kind of the, the smaller term research questions into the overall system. Great. Thank you. Angie, any comments on that? The research gaps at the field level versus academic research or 
lab research? Or? Yeah, I, I think both Larry and Gord's examples were really good. And, and again, they come back to that need for long-term research trials because like both of their examples were essentially like, you know, we know this good thing about these practices, what are the other implications of the of this practice? And, and I think farmers across Ontario are also looking for, for a more prescriptive approach. So, okay, you can make these broad brush statements about what, uh, what a practice is going to achieve, but what's that going to look like in my field and, and what's that going to look like, you know, in even within the fields on, on my same operation. So um, I, I think this is just the nature of research, right? Like you get more information, it just begets more questions and that's okay. But um, yeah, that, that's why you need that continuous input from the end users, um, which on farm really as a program really prioritized. Uh, and and building that into the research questions and kind of tweaking those long-term trials as you go along is really valuable. And then we see it aligning with um, with you know the federal priorities that that are communicated through the agricultural climate solutions package, for example. Um, you know these these soil health co-benefits and and what we uh, what we hypothesize them contributing to to greenhouse gas emission mitigation and carbon sequestration like that's that's all I guess uh, indicating on farm was a bit ahead of its time in in how we were looking at those and now we're we're knowing they're also going to be co-benefits. Excellent. Thank you for bringing that into the conversation. I have one question in the chat I want to get to, and then I have another question for all of you. But uh, this one is, no-till is great for soil erosion control and other benefits, but relies almost entirely on glyphosate. Can we keep coming up with new herbicide chemistry once resistance makes glyphosate and its successors obsolete? So there's a maybe challenging question for somebody who, want, who wants to tackle that. Have any thoughts on that? Larry? It's something I think of a lot. Uh, there's some really cool work being done by a couple of farmers in the States that are no-till organic. Now, they're in areas of heavier rainfall, uh, and, and we're learning how some of that, but, you know, regardless, can we bring some of that here? Uh, the concerns around glyphosate are, are huge. Um, a couple of years ago, there was some work being done out West on using high pressure and high temperature steam uh, on a planter. And I, I'm not sure where that's at. They thought they were prototyping. So there, I, I think some of this can be engineered. We can engineer our way through it. There's also some work being done with, with lasers and high light. And can we get that up to field scale, uh, you know, where it can keep up the planting speed? Uh, those are cool ideas. Oh, interesting. So hopefully coming up with some more innovative technology around that mm -hmm. question. Does anyone else want to add to that? Let's move on to another question. Um, great. I think I'll go to, uh, we're almost at the end of our time. So I want to get a nice last question in here. Um, yeah, I guess I'll kind of go along with the theme of the morning. And if you could each share one piece of advice for a grower looking to incorporate a new soil health or water quality BMP into their operation, what would it be? So what's your piece of advice to, for a grower looking to incorporate a new soil health or water quality BMP into their operation? Gord, i start with you. Um, I guess do it on small scale for a start. Don't do it by the road so the neighbors see the if it didn't work. <laughs> but but do something like don't try to to get complicated quickly. Like uh, cover crop, plant something, just one species or two species, uh, and, and uh, see how that works, and then you know expand on it. Um, that'd be my advice. Great, thank you. Keep it simple and not at the road. <laughs> That's good. Uh, Larry, do you want to add anything to that? I didn't do either of those. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I guess the soil matters. We need to look after it. Figure out something that you would like to try that works in your context. Because uh, context is critical. But but figure that out and then try it. Like. And if you don't want to do it by the road, it makes good conversation if you do. <laughs> Perfect. Put a little sign up and ask the neighbors <laughs> how you're doing. <laughs> Great. Uh, Karen, what advice would you give to a grower looking to implement a new practice? 
Um, well, if they haven't already, do some preliminary soil sampling. So you have a bit of a benchmark to start with to monitor your progress. And then I would say, be a, realize you're going to have to be adaptive and flexible. You probably won't find the correct solution uh, to your problem at first, and you might have to change your approach as you go. Great. Thank you. Colin? Yeah, lots of great advice, Yeah, And I think the other thing as well is just really, you know, lean on your, your neighbors and networks, right? So, I mean, there's people probably in your area that have tried these practices before. Um, you know, there's resources out there. They probably learned a lot of the hard lessons. And I'm sure you're still going to learn them yourself. But, um, yeah, there's there's a lot of existing knowledge out there that you can tap into. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. Angie? Yeah, just just echoing what what Colin said, and and you know Larry's point about how it makes a great conversation. Have those conversations, um, you know, get get out and and talk to others, not just about what what they've done uh, and learned from, but but what you're learning along the way as well. And and uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, shameless plug for for uh, programs like this. That's that's the whole point, right? We want people to learn from what's being done and, and what's being. Um, investigated through programs like on farm so I, I hope even attending events like this has got people's wheels turning uh, about what they might be willing to try next great thank you i'm curious just a little add-on on that is uh what is the importance of goals like for the farmers the goal to improve soil quality or soil health to protect water quality or their own uh, stewarding the land for the next generation does that ever come into the conversation of setting goals for what you're hoping to accomplish by trying these new practices. Angie, I might start with you and then if Larry or Gord want to comment on that. It, yeah, I mean, I think we found, you know, the like the fundamental goal and kind of intrinsic motivation of all of our on-farm cooperators was to be good stewards and and to to ask the right questions um, or just to ask any questions, period. And I think asking questions and being curious, like that goes hand in hand with setting goals. So I'm not sure that one is more important over the other, but um, it definitely... I think having a goal definitely like keeps you motivated long term when you do hit those those bumps in the road and and keeping vision on on what's to be gained further down the road is is going to keep you motivated most inherently. Perfect. Thank you. Larry, do you want to add anything there? Sure. I mean, our ultimate goal is to stay in business. Yeah. And but at the same time, we've never farmed the way we do today. We've never worked huge hundreds of acres fields and had water get going on one side and run off the other. So, and we've never, don't know if we've ever had algal blooms, like, like all of these things that, that are, are spinning off. So a goal is to, to stop losing the soil and still grow a good crop doing it. Excellent. Yep. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Gord, one last word from you. Uh, one thing I kind of, through my career, I've always questioned what we do and the bottom, or the question I always ask, is there a better way of doing it? Just because we've been doing it in the past, you know, is there an improvement we could make along the way? So whether it's cover cropping or tillage, when I started farming, we mow or plowed. And, uh, and at the time, that was the best thing out there because that was the only thing out there. And, you know, through time and progression and conservation tillage and no-till and all this. So, you know, I was always willing to ask the question, is there a better way of doing it? And if I wasn't sure, do a bit, try it on a small scale. So That's great. Excellent. Thank you. And that's a great note to end the, uh, this panel on. So if you want to try something, just get out there and give it a go. <laughs> but ask for resources and tap into all the wonderful programs and expertise out there as well. So thank you for that panel. I really appreciate all your time and insights this morning. And with that, I am pleased to welcome Andrew Jamieson to give some closing remarks. Andrew is the Man Manager of Innovation, Engineering and Program Delivery for the Central Eastern Ontario Unit in the Environmental Management Branch at OMAFRA. So Andrew, if I could turn the microphone over to you. Great. Thanks, Bronwyn. And I apologize that you will not see my, whether it's beautiful or ugly mug face, because uh, my camera on my computer is not working. So unfortunately, I cannot put on my camera. But um, I really relish the ability to to sort of wrap up this, this forum. Um, I'm going to steal a line from Jen Dolan. I think this is the pearl... Um, project for our minister, or at least for our, our branch. Um, 
you know, I've, I've had mesh experience in, in working in the field and trying to capture the edge of field data all from my masters to working with AFC for a period of time. Um, and I know the challenges in trying to set up a, a, a huge research project like this to be on farm and to be working with actual farmers to dealing with in all the variables that exist with trying to run an, a, a, a research project over a number of years. And so there's always sand fresh uh, associated with it. So when we sat down looking at to, to develop this, there was this clear need to develop um, some soil health indicators and, and to get a better sense uh, of our BMP effectiveness at reducing nutrient losses. And, you know, we've made some significant investments specifically in the water. We This is our second go around. We invested in some of these sites in Glassy and now moving forward in the cap, we've, we've done that, managed to, you know, really get a real robust set of data that's gone over at least a decade of period of time to get a sense of the difference in the climates and the different uh, years that one could have in, in a given growing season, wet to dry. And so all of that is really important for us to get a sense of as the BMPs that we're promoting, are they doing the, the expected impact that we're having? And so all of these measurable benefits that we're trying to get through this this scientific approach and using it as a practical application on farm to get this. Um, there's definitely need to do, um, you know, basic research at some of our research farms and across, but really when you get to the farm, there's all the extra variables of, of the timing, the application, the regional application of, of stuff, the, the equipment available, the, the suppliers, the, need, the all kinds of, of variables that can go into this that it always presents a challenge, but when you can pull it together in, in such a great way, it really is a benefit. And the other piece to this is really trying to, to bring people together. Uh, we looked at this when we first sat down, looking at how to take some elements of those, if anybody familiar with the Discovery Farm uh, network that existed in the US, we tried to bring in some um, collaborative components to that in terms of bringing out with the stakeholder working group and, and bringing along events like such as this and we even had the pandemic, we still managed to get people to come out and the virtual aspect has brought even perhaps some of us closer, people like Jen up in the north and eastern part getting to, to partake in, in some of these activities is really beneficial because I think that's a real big selling point to on farm is its ability to share information um, and demonstrate that because we all know um, that that's a very important method and, and very effective method of, of getting people to perhaps buy into some of these practices. And we just talked about it in the panel. I love the fact that we have a guide to perhaps give information on how to do it on your own farm, um, you know, moving forward. So all of this has been a real, real been pleasure. And I, I can't thank enough the people that um, have put this together, um, you know, our, our partners and OCA, Angie, uh, Madeline James, I appreciate your effort in and bringing Wil bringing the Wilton Group to facilitate a great event, and and Bronwyn and Andrea, you know our our partners and the the CAs who have been there for a while. I can't thank SRG enough for setting up some of these established uh, sites across the province. Um, you know, and it goes without saying that none of this really happens without the cooperators. I know for myself, working as far back as the early two thousands when. Working in Quebec, you know, to work with actual farmers that are willing to let people come on their land, put up these little huts and, and so forth and show up and do sampling. Um, it's really, you're the true sort of pioneers in allowing us to get this information because it's crucial information that helps others. And so really kudos to all of those who have supported this over the long run and really appreciated of, of everybody's effort um, who's partaken this last three years. And I'm, I'm sure there's, uh, I know there's a what I've heard and what I'm bringing back to to mind is there's a need for continued effort in this long term monitoring because as we've all uh, many of the speakers talked about today was the need for long term investment into these types of um, these types of projects because of the nature of this information takes time for the actual see changes which is all again if we can get that timely effort and we can give the information to individuals to preach the patience uh, needed in order to get to where we'd all like to see farmers be, that is where we, um, where we ultimately want to get. So I'll leave it at that. I really appreciate uh, everybody's effort for showing up today and, and thank you all for attending and hopefully everybody has a, a good rest of the day and week. Great. Thanks.
Thank you, Andrew. Uh, so thank you for that. And on behalf of OSCIA, I would like to thank all of you for joining us this morning to, for this forum. And please visit the OnFarm website for more information and updates, including the forum summary report and the recordings from today's event. And there will also be a brief post-forum survey that will be emailed to all attendees shortly. So please provide your feedback, which always helps us prepare for uh, future events to make them even bigger and better. And with that, I'll uh, close our forum for today. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much.